Brian, do you know that I have very, uh, very like scarred up lips? Are you aware of this? No. From I've had my lips busted multiple multiple times, and I have scar tissue built up in my lips. Did you know this? Were you one of those kids that just had constantly chapped lips growing up? No. And they would just break open and. No, that would be from Accutane <laughs> or something like that. Did you? Were you on Accutane? Never. I've never had a problem with acne in my entire life. Oh. Not me neither. Can't really. you tell from this? Me neither. I haven't had a pimple in like skin. 10 years. I do have rosacea. I have rosacea and I get dry patches of skin. So I have to, every time I shower, I have to put, which is every day, I put uh, lotion on my face. How many times do you shower a day? Uh, typically, well, that's not true. Sometimes, sometimes twice if I'm, if I wake up in the morning to go to work, I'll shower. And sometimes if I don't want to shower in the morning, the next day I'll shower at night. So sometimes twice. Okay. I, I pretty much shower twice every day, which is a problem in the winter time here. I get so dried out. Yeah. Those two showers. Oh, yeah. yeah, I do. The reason, anyway, the reason your, I asked scar tissue. The reason <laughs> I asked, yeah, about the the if you notice that I have like I have like these weird flaps of uh skin on my lips. So I don't, I don't look at tell. your lips. Okay, fair enough. Just keep keep going. So I it's awkward. I was eating the other day and I bit the shit out of my lip. That happens a lot. With that scar tissue. Because your lip is so fat. Yeah. Filled with scar tissue. <laughs> yes. And sometimes I'm chewing so intently that I'll just bite the shit out of my my own flesh. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I, so I was doing a video this week and I noticed that it was swollen. And I was like, I hope people don't think that I have herpes. <laughs> Ew. I don't, know, Jake. I don't know why that's like the, the end result that I went to. but um, It's funny. We had a similar conversation on After Schmo. We were talking about doing videos with yeah. boogers in our notes. That was a legitimate concern that I had this week, too. So it's funny. It went from boogers to herpes. I also thought yeah. you were – part of me thought you were going to segue into a Red Hot Chili Peppers discussion because Brando had that hot take <laughs> earlier this week. No. Scar tissue is – uh a song by That's the right. Red Hot Chili Peppers. For anybody who didn't know that, do you bite your tongue much? Um, bite there your was, lips. There was like a week or two where I just kept biting the shit out of my cheek. Yeah, and so from the first bite, it would swell up, and I would have a whelp on it. And because it was enlarged, I would keep biting yeah. it over and over again. And you probably remember this. I don't know if I ever brought it up to you, but that was the week where I thought I got to get rid of my wisdom teeth. My mouth is getting too crowded. I'm biting the shit out of my cheek. And that was that was yeah. months ago. I had this whole thing. I posted on Facebook. Does anybody anybody know a good dentist, orthodontist, that can get rid of my wisdom teeth ASAP? But I had friends hook me up, people that worked at the UK dentistry school. And I Bo- forgot about Beaumont it. Beaumont Dentist Office. That's where I go. I, I forgot about it. And here we are six months later and I never needed my wisdom teeth. <laughs> Do you have the same trajectory when you like bite the inside of your mouth? Mine is, uh, it happens and it hurts immediately and it's kind of fine. It's just this wound in my mouth, but I know that three days later it's going to be super sore. Mm-hmm. Like it's going to get sore for like an entire week. So now, and I'll kind of forget about it, but like I just took a drink of water or it's not water, that's, that's coffee. coffee. And I put it in my, like the straw in my mouth and I was like, fuck it just, I could feel it. It was awful. I'm sorry to hear that. Go to kiss my lady friend and I have to do like this weird, like, kiss this side. Don't kiss the other side. You don't have rosacea. Uh, I do. Never, never seen evidence of it. I do. Uh, I'll, there was like a while where I looked like an MMA fighter. I just had like these red patches under my eyes and uh, it wasn't good. I've got, I don't know what it's called. I have some bumps. It, you, eczema. You, it's not eczema. It's not eczema is a whole like itchy thing too. It's right. it's not that. It's just it's just some bumps. They're not really discolored. They show up when I get cold because they get a little purple, mm-hmm. like how your skin purples. They purple more, but uh, when I when I get tan, it goes away and you can't even notice that I have it. Had it ever since I was a baby. The epidermis is a strange organ. Yeah, let's talk about uh, <laughs> let's talk about Parkway Drive for a second, okay? Did I really? Did I? Gross. Did I set you up for a unfortunate set of circumstances? I've been taking a beating. Yeah, I have been taking. I, I I'm just, usually the one that that gets stuff like that, right? You you brought this up the second I got yet another 
notification <laughs> from this Derek Wilson guy. It literally happened two minutes ago. I'm I'm just getting hammered, and I'm thinking about privatizing. Either you can't. I know because <laughs> so this. Let, let me just go through a track record here Ugh. of some things since Sight and Sound YouTube channel has been a thing. God, I started with the highly suspect video. Okay, I did a review for the band Highly Suspect for their album. They had a song called My Name is Human that is fantastic. It's a great song. And I went and checked out the album, as you would, and I didn't care for it. I didn't I didn't trash it. I think I gave it somewhere in the C range. But their fans just lit me up. I yeah. mean, they went crazy. Which is nuts because My Name is Human was the first time I had ever heard of that band. Right. And apparently that band was a lot bigger than i realized they had the song they have, lydia yeah they have a very passionate fan base that i was totally unaware right. of so that was just such a that was just such a funny thing to experience right because it was just, this random unsuspecting band is attacking sight and sound. and then we had the uh from first to last video that i did that one was uh pretty interesting as well that one i understood there was the august burns red album review that i did yeah and there was the Max Landis video. Yeah. The Max Landis one was the one where I was getting hammered. And so I, are you up to five now? Was that five? Yeah, and there's probably some more. Okay. But there's some other ones like kind of sprinkled out. And it's weird because music typically, at least my experience for the most part, has been pretty good on the channel. It's when you go in a direction of something that's not shared, like if – if there's like a collective consciousness that this album isn't great, like for instance, the Justin Timberlake one didn't really get hammered for that album right. because a lot of people were thought it was an unfortunate album. I did one for Alt J that people just didn't like, didn't hear much about. But when you go in the direction, the opposite direction of something like our Westworld takes or our Twin Peaks takes, when you do that with music, oh my God, it's like you Whew. fucking said that Star Wars was the worst thing. I ever. was going to say, I thought the movie community was bad. Right. For those of you who don't know, up until this point, and the reason why Jay is calling me out for saying that I want to hide the video, up until this point, watching Jay get these beat downs, it's been <laughs> oddly satisfying to me. Yeah. Because in our daily lives, no one approaches Jay or speaks to Jay anywhere near like forget like jay just being crit like it's just the exact opposite as to what i know every experience jay has with other people if jay is around any of my friends they don't even think about doing anything as far as making fun of him that's right let alone <laughs> i'm above that let alone calling him names because i'm a nice and, guy and just tearing him down absolutely tearing him down so i'm secretly Maybe it, it's been easier for me to say and have the opinion of I like being polarizing because if anything still gets us more attention, blah, 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 blah. But up until this point, it was you th that was right. primarily getting the beat. Down. <laughs> and does that, so does that come from the fact that in, in the movie community, as much as we do like to champion the fact that we do like to have different takes and different opinions, they're not, they're not usually so off kilter that people are just like completely taken back by it. And also the movie community, it's not as niche and protected as music is. I th Well, I think music is more intimate Yeah, in the, in the way that like new media mm -hmm. is intimate. I mean, there's just, there's just more, well, it's funny cause you've had the take that musicians don't interact uh, with their don't. followers yeah. as much as some other people do, but the, the art form is what's more intimate. Yeah. Um, constant it's more it's you're listening to it every day sometimes right and so it's just more personal so i guess that's that's what makes it so much more right. passionate and it was just it was just such a mob mentality i mean there may be two comments out of the i don't know a lot there may be two of those comments that are like ah it's not a big deal and then the ones that were like laughing were the people that are in our Facebook group that already know where I was coming from and know who I am. There's only been maybe one stranger who yeah. has been like, eh, it's not a big deal. What, what you think? It's fine. Well, and it's it sort of, and I think one of the reasons that we have this sort of, I'm not necessarily shocked by it, but it does up, 
upset me and it frustrates me because for one, we have sort of cultivated a community here at Sight and Sound that is accepting of different opinions. Like we just, I mean, all the time. In fact, I even saw Brando post something on his personal Facebook group or not Facebook group, but Facebook profile asking his general followers, his, his general audience, what they thought of the Under Oath song. And like in our group, the people that even care, we've liked it. We thought it was really good. But then I just saw a bunch of people on there that were like, it's trash. It's not good. It's awful. And he was, and I know that he likes the song and he was just like, cool. And it made me happy that right. that, that happens outside. So when we do step out <laughs> outside of that circle and that's just not how people feel about it, because you and I talk all the time, we like a lot of things and we've seen people on the internet not like things that we like. And we just, we're just like, oh, it's okay. It's cool. If somebody were to go on and just thrash Bonnie Iver right now, I I don't, I wouldn't care. I right. just wouldn't give a shit. The one thing that kind of astonished me is you came in and into my defense and you were like, essentially, someone called me out for why are you commenting on this video or reacting to this video when you don't even like this genre? And my response was, yeah. oh, you just made up your own truth that I don't like this genre? Because right. I, I never said that in the video. I said I didn't really listen to Parkway Drive. And you came in, and were, if you had followed this channel for any particular amount of time, mm -hmm. you would know that that's simply not the case. Yeah. And then he came back and was like, "I learned my lesson." And I was like, "What yeah. the hell is that?" Yeah, I guess he. And, I guess he went back and I don't maybe listen to some podcasts. So what if we? What if we got a, a request from him to be in a Facebook group? It made me wonder. Should we have some kind of like preloaded response, <laughs> like a, a few minutes ago when I walk into Jay's house, I have I have this condition this method to walking into the house when i know that the dogs are right at the door you might be familiar with this if you have dogs you walk into the house or you open the garage door blah 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 they are freaking out they're you're gonna walk in they're gonna jump all over you maybe you have food in your hand they're gonna go absolutely ape shit but i've learned that if I just walk in and walk right past them and never look at them never make eye contact they will never jump on me, and I will bypass all of that ridiculous nonsense that I have to deal with with those dogs. Right. So I'm wondering, someone comes in and says, fuck you, your attitude sucks, blah, 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 your opinion doesn't matter, blah, blah, blah. What if I was just like, thanks for checking out the video, we try to be accepting of it. Like, just completely bypass what they've actually said and give them, give them a sight and sound pitch in general. <clears throat> Uh, I wonder how that would go over. Yeah, you know what's funny about that is over time I've learned a few defense mechanisms to build into my videos. Like, for instance, <laughs> a, a few things. For instance, the, let's just throw out the um, the turnstile review that I just did. I made it a point to put a Comeback Kid album on my wall behind me to show that, yes, this isn't my first rodeo with this music genre. Right. I also uh, also th will throw in and implement just a little bit of history that I have with the band or the genre mm -hmm. to let people know where I'm coming from with it. And I will also institute in my videos a, a, a statement that might be against what I'm saying to refute a potential claim and also just constantly stating, this is just my take and it's okay it's okay to have different opinions. That's to usually towards the end. You stay away from the meat of the conversation there. But uh, towards the end, I will say, if you don't like what I'm saying, then, you know, then defend, make your point. Just tell me what you think. Uh, tr prove me wrong. I give them the permission to have a debate, but th I'm not going to entertain. I mean, I don't say this, but I'm not going to entertain just like shitty comments and stuff like that. It's just right. not going to happen. Right. So th certain things like I love rap music, I love hip hop music and this and that, but I'm not a hip hop head and I'll be the first to admit it. Um, but I, I'll review hip hop albums and this and that. So when people come in with like trying to drop legitimate knowledge, I just won't respond because they they probably do have a better perspective than I do. I'm just telling you what I heard. For what it's worth... That Parkway Drive song is fucking awful. <laughs> it is straight garbage. 
it not only is it garbage because just objectively it's not good. If you like the song, that's fine. I that I don't have a problem with you liking it. But technically, the song is trash because the whole f the song doesn't even really kick in until like a minute and a half in, and it's just this self indulgent theatrical over the top for the sake of being over the top spoken word nonsense. The again to add to the fact that it's self-indulgent it's just focused on the singer's right. face he's right. making these melodramatic facial expressions it's so unattractive and not only that the the actual instrumentation that kicks into the song could be from any song they literally just stop the spoken word and just throw in like these over the top shitty guitar riffs and not only that the song's not even that fucking heavy it's not that heavy of a song. <laughs> like, at the end of the day, I can still enjoy an Amir song because it's just ridiculously heavy. Right. That song isn't that heavy. Right. It's nothing. If if any band, if somebody brought that song to you as a band and said, hey, I got this great idea for a song, nine D9 out of 100 people would probably say, this is not a good idea. I don't know if there is a Parkway Drive song that you could give to me that I would love. I actually think there probably is, yeah. I don't I don't know that there is, but yeah. I... It, it's funny. Everything you just did there was way worse than how I spoke in that video. Yeah. I laughed because I laugh at that kind of music in That's general. why I've wanted you to do I know. video reactions. So, yeah. maybe I, need, I, need I to, love your reactions to I need heavy music. Maybe I need just a better way to... F to figure all that out. Maybe uh, we need to do something together. Why? I don't know. Just in case, like... Cushion? Well, the you, cushion you can have your reactions and I'll come in and be like, yeah, what he's doing, he's right. <laughs> this thing is pretty terrible. Well, I just... Or I could just every, hold up cue cards of other bands that you like while, while you're right. reacting. Everything, everything I said, it just wasn't malicious at all. It was like, this video isn't attractive. Yeah. Like... Why, as a music video, you made a music video that isn't fun to watch. It's it's just an it's nothing, like you said, right. and it's it's his face the entire time, but you can't even see his face. So it's like, it's just for one, it's just not a good video, and that's why it's called a music video reaction. And then I included that, yeah, I didn't like the song, and then that was it. Yeah, it was like, and and people went absolutely bonkers. If you the epitome of what it's like to be on YouTube. If yeah. you guys don't know, our YouTube channel is in the description of this podcast. Go to the link, find my Parkway Drive video, and it is just an absolute shit show. Well, the the other thing that I'll say, too, is that this whole concept of what we're doing on our channel and all this other stuff is taken from existing things that exist in the, or in the movie space and in television and we're bringing it over to music. Of course, there are music critics that exist, but I would say safely that there are not a lot of people that are doing what we're doing with music the way it's been done with movies and television for like the last five years or so. Uh, there are music critics out, especially for this niche music genre. There's not a lot of people reviewing albums like this. There are people out there that exist, but with with the, we have a very schmoes no kind of flavor towards what we do. I think um, there are some other reviewers that I think we probably share some things in common with. It just doesn't exist specifically. Like if I were to go and watch other music video react, typically a music video reaction are usually positive, but we just throw in, you know, criticism with it. So if you're just going there to reaffirm what your opinions are of something and not have it challenged, then I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Do you think there's anybody from that watched that video that's like, well, I'm going to spend a whole week checking out their content? No. Yeah. No. Hell no. Yeah. I also don't know what would come over somebody to say, I obviously have enough knowledge of this person to determine that they they are not knowledgeable. Yeah. It makes It's just, like I said, it's just yeah. the epitome of YouTube. Nobody knows what the fuck they're talking about. Yeah. But you can't, you can't private test it because I wanted to make I my, won't. I I'm wanted not. to make my, uh, my, video to what's his name max landis private and you said no but that that can but be monetized right right the secret is my video can't <laughs> i feel like we've gotten some subscribers from it maybe we've probably gotten a from few. parkway the parkway maybe. drive thing 
the the vocalist. He's he's Australian. Okay. You got anything else up top before we uh, take a break? I don't think so. We're gonna take a break and then. You want to do just kind of a open-ended movie conversation? Maybe yeah. talk about the Oscars. I feel like this whole episode is going to be more open-ended loose. than normal. Yeah, but it okay. seems like there's just not one overwhelming topic. Well, maybe that's not well, true. Well, there's a, there's a lot of cool movie tidbits, but yeah. I did want to have some kind of Oscar representation, even though we're going to run into a, this classic thing. Jay and I record on, well, we're recording this on Saturday evening. Um so our takes are pre-Oscars, but the episode will be released post-Oscars. So it won't be so much an Oscar reaction, but it, it'll be fun to sort of talk about it going into it and then having the knowledge of the results when the episode comes out. So there's that. And then, uh, then we'll go TV music. It sounds good to me. Let's take a break. There are so many different types of music fans in the world. Casual fans, diehard fans, music nerds. One of the reasons I love music so much is because of the stories, the mythology that you simply can't get from listening to a song or an album. That's why we're so proud to announce our brand new seasonal standalone show called More Than Music. More Than Music is our first ever scripted show on Sight and Sound. Whether it's the story of Bonnie Iver's iconic debut album being written in his father's hunting cabin, or the story of Kanye West's 808's and Heartbreak album and how it would shape the next decade of rap and hip-hop. Join me every month for the next four months as I break down some of music's most fascinating stories. More Than Music is available right now on our podcast feed wherever podcasts are found, or you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and check it out there. You know how... Uh, this is the segment I started. Well, you waited too long. I was waiting for you. You, I, I was getting the tab open. You know what's sad? <laughs> what? I've got people. So much of what I can tell is uh, crossover success is by if it's discussed at my day job or not. I'm having random people emailing me and asking me and coming up and talk talking to me. So, what are your thoughts on Black Panther? I figured you're the you're the one to ask and talk to about these things. And I'm having to tell them that I haven't seen it. I still haven't seen Black Panther. I don't know when it's going to be. But uh, I love it, though. I do love that it's such a success. So did you give them my email? or No. So the Razzies came out uh, like a second ago. Well, maybe not a second ago, a few hours ago. Second ago. Well, when we're recording this. I want to... You might be able to actually guess some of these. I'm not going to read the nominees or anything. I'm just going to... There was one movie in particular that cleaned up. Do you, uh, Annihilation. To, to you, what is the worst movie of 2017? Emoji. Yes. Movie. Yes, exactly. Which is strange because I heard uh, some people talking about the Wreck-It Ralph 2 trailer that came out this week and how great of an idea it was that, that they're going through the internet. And it was like, didn't they do that in an Emoji movie? And guess what? It's, My it's, hot take, Wreck-It Ralph super overrated it's just it's just the approach it's the attitude it's the, it's the attitude uh, wreck it ralph when i watched it i said the myself, trailer made this, me laugh yeah the trailer was cool nothing about yeah. the emoji movie made me laugh yeah the heat meter on wreck it ralph 2 from jay williams below lukewarm that doesn't mean anything to anybody that's i'm just listening. saying they might want to know my take on it <laughs> they might want to know my take i thought wreck it ralph was a mediocre at best animated film <laughs> all of our movie fans are like, <laughs> i wonder if they truly wanted to know the, the people that are here for movies what your take was on <laughs> doesn't matter i just need to lay the groundwork <laughs> right at, right after you said I oh it's a, gonna get even better when I we start talking about these black panther we start talking about these oscar movies i cannot wait to drop some knowledge oh, about, boy. about these best picture nominees um Worst picture, sure enough, was Emoji Movie. Worst actress, which is hilarious and a creative, interesting way to be sexist. Tyler Perry for Boo 2, the Medea movie. Yeah. Uh, worst actor. And this is one of those cases, kind of like the Oscars. It seems like th there's an, a, a winner, and I'm just saying there's no way that that's true. Like, I don't care how many people like this movie. There's no way that this actor deserves this award kind of reminds me the the last time that that happened was when Mark Rylance beat Stallone. 
It's like Mark Rylance, everything he's been in, he has been been the most surface level actor. It's like, okay, he's an old guy. He's in Dunkirk. He's being an old guy. Okay, he doesn't do anything in that movie. And in the brief moments that he's in the Ready Player One trailer, he is legitimately terrible. Awful. I didn't even know he was in the trailer for Ready Player One. Yes. He is awful. I'm looking at an actor, and I don't ever get to do this, especially in a trailer, because you can hide that kind of stuff. Dialogue plays while an action scene. Like, you're not seeing a performance, but... The moments that Mark Rylance has in the Ready Player One trailer, I'm sorry. He is legitimately awful in them. And it's possible that we get into the movie and we see that it's just part of his character. It's so stoic, monotone. He's looking directly at the camera. So can I, I can imagine maybe he's reading from a teleprompter. Maybe that's part of the character. He's reading some kind of speech, a, sort of a PSA, if you will. Maybe that's part of the role. But it's legitimately awful. And it bugs me that it's, in the, it's one of the first things you see in that trailer. It's like, that to me is terrible. It doesn't sell the movie at all. Garbage. Anyway... Here's another example of that. I haven't even seen the movie. I was excited to see the movie. The reviews came out, got away from me, decided maybe it's not worth my time. I'm telling you right now, without seeing the movie, there is no way in hell that Tom Cruise in The Mummy is the worst actor of 2017. It's just not true. I don't care. Is the way that they do that, they, they say like, here's a bad movie. And here's an actor that stood out in the movie, in a bad movie. I don't know. I I, I hope not. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how they do it either. Worst supporting actor. There's no was, point in me trying to wrap my head around. Like, like, okay. Worst supporting actor is Mel Gibson for Daddy's Home 2. I heard a lot more about that performance. I don't remember anybody body saying Tom Cruise was bad in The Mummy. Everyone said The Mummy was bad. Right. Worst screen combo, any two obnoxious emojis in the emoji movie. Worst supporting actress, Kim Basinger for Fifty Shades Darker. That's, that's hilarious. Worst remake, ripoff, or sequel, Fifty Shades Darker. Worst director is the director of the emoji movie, Anthony Leondis. Special Rotten Tomatoes Award, the Razzie nominee, So Bad You Loved It, Baywatch. Worst screenplay, emoji movie. So in the public consciousness, it pretty much nailed down everything that I heard that was bad about 2017 because this is me cheating a little bit because I'm the quote-unquote movie guy of sight and sound, but I usually have a pretty good gauge as to whether a movie's worth my time or not because I'm taking in all of the stuff publicly. So right. for the most part, I see movies that are good to great because I'm ignoring all of the bad ones. So, and that's, that's sort of the joke. That's sort of the joke about people never knowing my opinion on movies is because I'm kind of the same way. I only see good to great movies. In fact, I'll probably just turn off a bad one. I just won't even finish it. So my, uh, my discussion about those movies, if like, it's just a good movie, I'm probably going to be way harder on it because I'm just not taking in, shitty movies all the time we actually kind of talked about that with annihilation right i said i was harder on that movie because i paid money to go see it in a movie theater right i feel like that's a human way to look at it yeah movie pass i used movie pass they're being weird right now like, yeah not, i saw some stuff on the internet about, there was a controversy that they were just shutting down accounts and yeah, what's up with that and people were spoken about it clark wolf from collider she's a pundit on collider one of her accounts was affected, and she got it completely canceled. So I looked it up. I saw it on the news, and it was this interview with the CEO. And he said the reason behind that was people were abusing the subscription service. So basically, if you don't know what I'm talking about, Movie Pass is a it's a subscription. You pay nine ninety nine. Well, it's actually seven ninety nine. I think now uh, you have like this debit card of sorts, and you pay a monthly fee. You can see all the movies you want, right? You probably know what Movie Pass is. So. How that works is that it's like if you if you think about what the median for a movie ticket is and considering like L.A. and then the premium prices, things right. like that, when you check into a movie, like when you tell it, I'm going to see Annihilation here in 10 minutes, it gives your card like thirty dollars. And so it's given you enough money to pay for the ticket, but it's also given you extra room for those 
uh, because tickets prices vary right. throughout the country, but in the terms and conditions and part of movie pass in general, the app, it doesn't even let you select IMAX or things like that. You right. just have to go to the most basic screening. But again, the prices fluctuate throughout the country. So they just give you enough money to basic a blanket amount. People were abusing that and buying those IMAX tickets anyway. Good. And sure. That's Absolutely. Fine. And, but the part that I sided with them on briefly was that they gave notices out. The CEO said that there were notices and warnings like, Hey, we're going to end up uh, terminating your account if you keep abusing this. And um, people did apparently, o- or they didn't get the emails and kept doing it, never knew. And then one day their account just wasn't working. Uh, so apparently that's happened. Um, our buddy, Kristen Smith said that she knew people that, weren't abusing it, never got an email and it still happened. Mm -hmm. And when they tried to con apparently their customer service is terrible. It reminded me of Spotify, how you just can't contact anybody for any reason. So I don't know. They're just being goofy. And then they, for whatever reason, and I didn't get to read the story, but I just noticed it earlier. They wouldn't let certain people see specifically red sparrow this weekend. And I don't know why I, I can't imagine it's anything. It has to be a glitch. Yeah. I don't know what else it could be. My my whole take with stuff like that is that anytime you have an app that's going to make people's lives easier, the consumer's lives easier, you have to build in the fact that it's going to be abuse. I'm talking about things like Netflix and account sharing. I'm talking about things like HBO and account sharing. I'm sure there's all kinds of examples of, of people doing that. My fucking Kroger plus card. Uh, Kayla doesn't have a Kroger plus card, so she just uses my number. I get all those points for my uh, gas deduction or whatnot. Um, You have to build that into it so much so to where the abuse shouldn't affect your business model at all. Um, And I I would say if there's ways to (laughs) to go around those things, then uh, that's, that's kind of on them. But they also do reserve the right to issue statements and right. cancel people's accounts. Now some of those other shady things they need to they need to get worked out for sure. But knowing that knowing that knowledge, I know that you said good in response to what I said though, mm-hmm. but it's like me when I hear that, I think Movie Pass is such a great deal. And yeah, specifically with Black Panther, I saw Black Panther twice in IMAX. Right. So I chose to continue to pay those ticket prices even though I already have that subscription mm-hmm. service because I wanted that experience. But overall, Movie Pass is such a great deal that if I see that I can't do something, I'm not going to do anything to mess it up. Right, of course. Because it's really cool. And Cinemark, AMC pretty much has Movie Pass on lockdown. They don't allow it. But Cinemark came out with a competitive service, the Cinemark something club, and it is terrible. Yeah. It's just not even a competition. It's like eight ninety nine a month for one movie ticket and like a drink refill, and then you have to pay for every other movie you see anyway. It's just the most nothing, like inconvenient service. So it's like something like Movie Pass is so great and so particular and special that I'm not doing anything to mess that up. Yeah, I mean, people need to get used to these new marketing tactics and whatnot for I think the theater going experience because within the next five to ten years we're going to you're going to see things like this come up, especially competing with at home viewing for certain things. I mean it's just going to happen. Yeah. And in fact, I think there are th- I think for me Movie Pass needs to do something like get get the companies that are using their service or whatever or cooperating with their service. They need to get them It seems like a very strange thing to do. Like uh, the way we're going to keep everything on the same playing field, regardless of what theater you go to, is just issue thirty dollars to your accountant. It's like I made that number up, but 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 I understand what you're saying. The idea of being a blanket. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. It seems like there should be I don't know a kiosk or something to how you check in with this stuff. I don't know. It it just seems like you should think about stuff like this before you do it. Um, But I also I've always been curious how you know. I'm sorry, real quick. I just I don't want to forget this. You know who should utilize something like Movie Pass is Netflix. Like if you have a movie that's going to be coming out on Netflix, but 
uh, you, let's say you do get a few theater or a few screens at a theater to show it. Like if you want to go see that movie that you can't see at your house on a big screen, you can do it using movie pass or something like that. Obviously that's that. I think that's coming. It's got, it's got to like give people the option, but also it. make it as easy as possible. Partner with these companies like that. And that, that reminds me of the kind of conversation we could also be having, which is having the premium in home box yep. to see those new releases. I mean, I do think it's a similar because that's a subscription model. The right. the filmmakers that are talking about this technology it's a blanket. As far as I remember, it's like a, a blanket subscription. It, it would, I mean, it would probably be, be 50 to a hundred dollars to be able to get movies in theaters at your house the mm -hmm. day that they're released. So, um, like that, pay, pay per view sports model sort of thing. UFC is, did you see that UFC is coming to, is it Hulu or Amazon? Like it's I just going to, I know that they're in talks with I different think companies. UFC is going to stream with, with Amazon now, which is, which is, yeah, they were having, well, yeah, that's a whole separate conversation. Um, Sight and Sound Sports, 2020. Where was I going? I brought up the you brought the up uh, you brought up the at home oh, box. Right. You know that's that's a I, weird thing. Like the whole box scenario. Like, do we need a box? Can you just give us an app? I know. I was gonna say that's got, fucking stupid. I agree. In fact, I would not do that specifically because they aren't. Uh, like one of the reasons I'm paying so much money I get that I'm getting to watch it at home, but it's also because you're building boxes. That's fucking stupid. So the, the box, yeah, I, you're, we're talking about an idea that's into the future. And then when you bring up the fact that it includes a box, it's like, wait a minute, what year is it? Right. Um. So first off, I remember when ultraviolet was introduced. So when ultraviolet was introduced, it's basically, when you had a DVD or Blu-ray, you could, they started with the digital copies. And from what I remember, for the most part, for a long time, it was just an iTunes digital copy. I remember buying so many DVDs, and it was just for iTunes when I wasn't utilizing iTunes. Right. Or at least I wasn't watching movies at the time on my laptop. Like, forget about Apple TV. Mm -hmm. Like There was just no way I could utilize that technology or yeah. that account. <laughs> and then it grew into the studio's uh, came up with ultraviolet and then when it first came out the only services that were utilizing it were flickster which was flickster bought out by rotten tomatoes or vice versa but flickster and voodoo for, at the start were the only two companies and so i took up voodoo right and i've been a voodoo customer ever since um owned by walmart um but now up uh, recently the past few months the studios came together and started this Movies Anywhere. So I don't know if you guys have seen this, but Movies Anywhere is basically being able to, because we've talked about this before, how it's annoying when everything is so spread out. Yeah. Um, and Movies Anywhere is basically just, kind of reminds me of like an RSS feed. It's like it has all of the movies that you have logged onto your account, but it's displayed on moviesanywhere.com. It's on Vudu. It sort of lays on top of everything else. It's on Amazon. Right. So basically you have this, here's the movies that I own, and it's across all of these apps. And the studios came together and came up with that. So it's it's kind of like, I, I, I would hope or I wish that this Movies Anywhere technology would become that yeah. premium service where, okay, Movies Anywhere right now is obviously free, you just put in a code and it's part of your account. But what if Movies Anywhere was a premium subscription service? And for an extra $50 a month, I have movies in a theater that I could rent right then and there. Yeah. And I could watch Red Sparrow right now. So it's like... That, that's sort of how Apple TV does their uh, their content. So you can, if you want to watch Atlanta, you can go to whatever... You, you can go to Sling and watch it live. Or you can go to the FX app and watch it. You can go to Hulu and watch it. Or you can go to iTunes and buy it. That's probably how Kindle works. You can do all of those things, but there's also an app just called TV on Apple TV. And if you go there, you can type in Atlanta and it comes up. Right. When you hit season one, it gives you the list of where, how you want to take it in. And then you can go to season two. And obviously there's only one selection, which is And, and that's iTunes. how like, that's how TiVo works too. Yeah. TiVo, TiVo works out. Well, and I said fire, uh, Kindle. I meant Google Amazon TV fire. back when Google TV was a thing and not just Google Chromecast. Right. So, um, 
Let's talk about some new movies. Um, I don't want to bother you. I don't want to irritate you. But you found out this news earlier in the week, or we talked about it off air, and this bothered you. Bothered you. So consider me the messenger. <laughs> so I'm obviously not breaking the scoop because I, I, I... Wait, if I'm considering you the messenger here, are you just telling me this, or am I supposed to react to you telling me this? You can react however you want. I just don't okay. want you to get... Well, I don't want you to be mad at me <laughs> for doing this on air because you were irritated that this came out. So... Um, we watch Collider Radio, and uh, I got How you doing? I got some interesting nuggets because you know people there are informed and know people in the studio system. They have scoops and informants, and right now I just I was taken aback by the news that apparently X Men Dark Phoenix is really good. And I, f- the the best that I felt about X Men Dark Phoenix, Phoenix was when it brought Dark Phoenix. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> when it brought Hans Zimmer out of retirement of superhero movies, because I didn't like Apocalypse at all, so it just kind of blew my mind. Like, really, Simon Kinberg, first time director, made a movie worthy of Hans Zimmer coming. But it's <laughs> I was just kind of like, that's that's promising. So here's the weird thing about this news. So. I, my trajectory with just X-Men films, just X-Men, not talking about Logan, Deadpool, or anything like that, just X-Men proper. The flagship movies. Has been a roller coaster. I mean, up and down so much. So like, I'm not, I don't love the first X-Men film. I think it's fine. I think it's, it's fine. It's I know some people love it and that's mm-hmm. cool. I, I get it. I think the second one's great. Obviously the third one is what it is. First Class is my favorite X Men film. Same, but there are some people out there that X, that First Class is just kind of okay. I did not like Days of Future Past. I don't think it's terrible. I just I didn't care for it that much. In the way that you just don't care for like Winter Soldier. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's just I'm just like I can do without it. I turned Apocalypse off. <laughs> That's a signal of it's a bad movie. I, I thought it was unwatchable. Um. With now <laughs> that I'm hearing this is good and that it's got Hans Zimmer, for some reason, I'm just thinking that, is this going to be completely different? I don't know. Like, up until now, the X-Men movies have felt like X-Men movies, good or bad. New Mutants certainly feels that way. Now I've, I've and especially because Dark Phoenix, the comic book, is very, I mean, it, it's dark. It's It's in the name. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, I'm kind of excited. Like, if it's just going to be so, – like, what if we show up and it's a fucking – it's like watching a Christopher Nolan movie. <laughs> now, now that I have a little bit more perspective on this, because Brian Singer, he's the godfather we of We talked this. about this. I love the cast going to the movie. Right. So Brian Singer is the godfather of this franchise. He was the savior of superhero movies there for a time. And so much shit has come out about him and his personal yeah. life. And I don't even want to do that. But One of go- the most overrated directors in Hollywood. Well, there's a diehard usual suspects fan who will challenge you on that, but. I'm not. I'm not even going to defend that anymore. I will take your usual suspects, and I will. Uh, I will see you. A Superman Returns. I don't mind Superman Returns. I like the romantic aspects of Superman. He fought on a island made of kryptonite, and people cried in the theater when he was getting beat up. Good, because Superman is a terrible comic book character. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> it part of me just. Part of me thinks, and Days of Future Past kind of goes against this argument, but Days of Future Past had so much involvement from, like, Matthew Vaughn, and I don't know how much Matthew Vaughn and company had with Apocalypse. I don't remember, but they had Deadpool, they had Logan coming out, they had Legion, and they had all this other stuff going for them that was really exciting in the X-Men franchise. Looking back on it with a little bit of perspective... It feels like Brian Singer just didn't get it. Yeah. Maybe he was stuck like with on this how, new vibe. Yeah. Maybe he was stuck on how things were done and like the people were talking about Apocalypse being the greatest hits. I'm worried. Of, I'm of, worried that you're going to fall asleep. 
right now? Yeah, you're like really leaned back into the couch. You look too relaxed. You know, I woke up from a nap before I came here. I know. But, I'm well rested. But like you look like you couldn't be sunken into the couch more than you I'm are right now. I'm just having a good time. Okay, fair enough. I didn't mean to interject. It just um, it worried me. <laughs> part of me just thinks Brian Singer just didn't get it because people claimed Apocalypse was the greatest hits. Um, and a, a retread of a lot of things that he himself had already done in his other movies. So he made Poe Dameron poopy. And it's it's funny thinking back on Apocalypse Poop because Dameron. it reminds me a lot. I just watched Justice League like yesterday. Justice League is a better movie than Apocalypse. Yes. Without a doubt. Apocalypse has good nuggets. There are things that I like about Apocalypse. Same. And, Agreed. And I can say the same things about Justice League. I mean, Justice League, I give it uh, a lot of leeway because I like seeing all those characters together. And I can sum it up to just being a product of we've already seen all of this before. I can't give the narrative or the story any credit. Uh, I could give it the benefit of the doubt because of the production issues, but it's like, it just reminds me a lot of apocalypse, but I think justice league is a better movie. Obviously the thing that I like about apocalypse are the same things that I actually like about first class. I love seeing young X-Men. Like, yeah. When I say young X-Men, I mean young like not the not Bobby Drake might be thirty five years old, you know, walking around. Teenage, the, yeah, teenagers. Yeah, teenagers. Talking right. about teenagers here. I like right. that. But I don't like is Apocalypse being Apocalypse, but he's like five foot eight. <laughs> there, there were times in that movie where Apocalypse was walking around, sh like looking s smaller than some of the teenagers, and that's not a shot at what's his name. Uh, What's his name? Poe Dameron? Why Oscar Isaac. It's not a shot at Oscar Isaac. It's just like, you couldn't have made him look a little bit more imposing. I don't remember. That glittery blue makeup. I don't remember Apocalypse fighting anybody. Like at least Steppenwolf yeah. was like wrecking shop. And there were some interesting fight scenes with him. Yeah. But like Oscar Isaac was walking around and recruiting people up until yeah. the point where the to final. Join my, my family i don't know the final battle it. scene was him up and collect oh wait that was magneto collecting all the trash yeah but <laughs> magneto was pointless at the end of the movie. but anyway uh apparently dark phoenix is good that's good i'm excited um and why would i've been mad at you about that news han solo that's what i was anticipating you preempted a discussion topic and then brought up something else 10 minutes ago yeah yeah so Han Solo is apparently good, uh, or at mm. least it's not as bad as we might be anticipating. Mm. Um, I The way that I read this, and again, this isn't a, an official report, but the way that I read this, it's probably going to be the worst of this era of the movies, Fair, which I was kind of prepared for anyway. When we say worse, can we just say it seems like it's not going to be as good? It'll never be. I don't think it'll be the majority anybody's favorite did we anyway. ever did we ever think that was going to even i don't know maybe yeah maybe i mean i just think that on the surface just throwing out the idea of a han solo solo film uh it was always going to feel like something outside of what we know and love of star wars so from the get go our expectations should just be completely washed away. We've never had a Star Wars movie about one character. I was going to say to yeah, I was going to say to clarify, you're not saying this movie this movie obviously utilizes one of the most popular characters, but of what course. you're saying what you're saying is it goes outside the box in terms of yeah. being a saga film. The and expect it's the, even Rogue it, it, it's more of a departure than even Rogue One because Rogue One is just like it's essentially a preamble to a new hope. People so. will have to walk out of that film adjusting how they how they judge Star Wars movies because we will have never seen it before. Right, it just will not have existed. Now, my reaction off air to you telling me this story was very frustrated, very upset. In fact, I could go on the exact same rant that I went on after Schmo of saying, "Are oh, you doomsday motherfuckers?" You were upset about the reveal of the information, not the take itself, right? Yes, yeah, specifically because we just came off of a collective conversation about judging by the trailer, judging by a minute and a half of what we've seen of this film. This could be insert hot take of 
awful to doesn't feel like and, and my whole thing this whole time has just been that you can't gather enough information to just to just say stuff like that and also the fact that a lot of these news organizations and news sites and shows and podcasts will take whatever nugget that somebody with a little bit of information has and run with it as if it is 100 percent the thing that's going to happen until a new news story comes out and it subverts it and they act like they never had that take to begin with that's what i get frustrated about is i want all these people who were reporting on this and doing hour-long shows discussing that han solo looks like it's going to be a flop now should come on air and say listen a month ago i said this and i was running with it maybe i I ran too far because now we're hearing that that's not the case what i don't want to happen is to do an hour-long show like they didn't fucking say that like hold yourself accountable for jumping to conclusions there was it was just thrown how i received it this isn't towards you i know this is towards how i received the information it was thrown out and i haven't because it's not possible right now. Yeah. It's not possible to expand on that idea because it can't be public knowledge that someone has seen this and has this take because so, it's embargoed. So it's it was just one of, uh, the, a tease of the worst kind. So, but in that same vein, people will not expand on the fact that the movie movie it sounds like the movie is good, but yet they will expand until they're blue in the face about how bad that it it possibly is and how we need to prepare for this to be a failure why is one okay and the other one it's just like up it's good is it because it's much more romantic to talk about the drama of things right i mean is that it i don't know Uh, that's that's my whole thing it just gets frustrating just at the risk of just for the sole purpose of speculating right speculation yeah and Um, and i get one of the reasons i'm so passionate about stuff like this is because the current state of news in general not outside of pop culture is full of fear-mongering and the second that you start to include that just for view it's just like it just gets gross man but then you could argue though like is that movie fear-mongering you could you could argue though that lucasfilm if they want can take over the narrative. Oh, absolutely. Put out another trailer. Yeah, you're right. Uh, with, with the, without but so much subtle footage. Okay, let's let's I did my own cuz I did my own fan edit of the trailer last night. I don't know if you saw it, but uh I put it to Redbone. Yeah. <laughs> and um I was able to really examine the footage. Did you get a copyright thing? I know it's a, no. <laughs> I know it's a teaser and I, and I'm not judging it as a teaser, but it's basically we have such limited reference yeah. at this point in time, and I know that's sort of the age old argument, but it's like you can at any point Lucasfilm can change the narrative. Do you think at any? Do you think that potentially Disney got so behind the behind schedule with production stuff and putting out promotional material, marketing material that they just sort of bit the bullet and said? We're not going to do this, and then saw the movie or whatever, and and they really are like they like it, and they're behind it, and maybe there could could there be a whole nother conversation of this. Let's just say this is the only thing we're getting, and we see the movie. Could that affect if we have lowered expectations? Could that affect how we walk out of the film and say, "Holy shit, that was great"? It could, yeah, it could. Yeah, I mean, it'd be like the Cloverfield paradox. If it was reversed, <laughs> like, it, if if it, the movie was good, if I don't watch this, whatever this next trailer drops, if I don't watch it and I go into that movie, more than likely I'm going to wind up enjoying it that much more, right? Because I had that limited amount of information. To, I would I would say that about any movie, really. I mean, that's just going right. back to ignoring trailers and why you want to go in with an open. I hope that Han the Han Solo film think, ends up being the first Star Wars movie to ever win an Oscar. But something you. <laughs> No, it'll never. It, it'll happen in the way that maybe Suicide Squad did, b- based on production. Design, but what if it did? But what if it did? What if? What if? This is. This would be my favorite thing to ever potentially happen. If the fans care so much about Alden Ehrenreich not feeling like Han Solo, but yet the Academy, who don't give a shit about what Han Solo feels like, awarded 
Alden Ehrenreich a best actor <laughs> I don't, for his performance. In I movie. don't think it means shit. Right. I think there are some people that like wish the Oscars um, paid attention to some of these movies. Yeah. But ultimately, it means nothing to Star Wars movies if they aren't considered as like no, no. Star Wars fans don't give a shit about the Oscars. And if the Oscars awarded Han Solo something, it, it wouldn't meet mean anything to them at all They'd it would be, just be funny it to would me. just be a reason to shit on the oscars yeah. because they didn't like the hot solo movie it, it well no it would be funny to me if the fans hated it like it would be hilarious if we had all this fan backlash about the last jedi and it ended up winning an, an award like that would be fucking hilarious um, to throw that at p- the people who hated it um and just to touch on the what you started out with at that point so i th- i think all of it is planned the yeah. the really the rollout of all the product, the marketing and stuff. I know that it feels late to us, mm-hmm. I, I, for whatever reason, whatever the reasons are. Right, they're I think much smarter. All, all than of it is planned. I don't think they were behind uh, with marketing. They right. were anyway. So um, I didn't know we were gonna do that whole digital conversation or whatever. But do, it's cool. Do you buy into? It's fine if we're a little bit longer on this segment. Uh, the other, are the other two segments gonna be shorter? Well, yeah, we probably. Can make it um, do you do you buy into? Listen, another uh, sort of something out of nothing news story. This is my take on it, at least from an outsider's perspective. This whole thing about Avengers moving up a week—that's cool. That's great. Um, why that was the case, I don't care. I don't think it's that big of a deal. I am sort of of the, of thinking that. They are just trying to give a little bit of room between that and Solo just just so that they're not necessarily cannibalizing one another. I actually don't think that was the deciding factor. Right. But it's definitely to Han Solo's benefit. Yeah. But I don't sure. I don't think that's what went into the decision making. Yeah. I think Avengers Infinity War is and will be the biggest movie in history. Okay. I I have so, nothing to go against it at all because I'm fucking I, I excited. Think, about I, it. I just I just don't think there's any questioning it, especially it, coming off of what Black Panther did. It it this this is the biggest movie ever. Period. Yeah, that includes internationally. Now, based on how movies are released, Marvel movies vary week to week internationally. Right. But because this movie is so big, because we have every reason to believe that this movie is packed with serious MCU repercussions. I think this is primarily to protect the entire world from spoiling it for each other. I I think it's that big of a movie where a a studio is saying, look, everyone has to see this at the same time. What if I don't see Black Panther before I see I believe it. I believe it. Um... I needed your reaction to be like, you can't do that. But you just like went with it. <laughs> so you, congratulations. I, that, that, you, you've I, known me long. I was going to say, I've come to expect this from me. Uh, your straw matches your mic cord. Um, <laughs> okay, maybe it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> it's a slight shade off. It thought it maybe Okay. Um, I, th- I, I think that's the main reason why. That, I can that, believe that. And, that and it gives it that much more attention. Because we still, again, we still only have one teaser trailer for it. So, well, that's not fair. Super Bowl. Yeah. The Super Bowl had its own thing, but a lot of that was repetitive and somehow even less than the actual trailer trailer. So your subway straw is a lot closer to your mic cord than your Starbucks straw. All three of them are green. What's up with green straws? Should I get it? Should I replace your black cord with a different colored cord? I don't know. I kind of like the colored cords. I do. I do like them. The character. But I don't know about green straws, but black straws, game changer. I don't think I've seen it. You know what? Yes, you have. Yes, you have. They're better uh, to chew on. Uh, Fazoli's? Fazoli's has the black straws. Uh, the the place over here, the, the burger place that you have over here by Subway. Burger King. Napa Prime. Napa Prime. Uh, they have black straws. People Bar- are going to find out where I live. <laughs> Bars have black straws. It's just, it's that much classier. Have you ever had boba tea? Or bubble tea. We we've done this. Well, okay. So the answer is <laughs> no. The answer is no. Correct. Do you know that they have wider straws? Like they have gigantic straws because of, you so have, the 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 globs of you have like goo. those Tide Pods that sit in the bottom. Of yeah. It. 
those are very uh, satisfying to chew on. But they come in different colors sometimes. Anyways, let's talk about the Oscars. Let's have this. Uh, let's call it the too late uh, <laughs> Oscars. Can, can I? Can Oscars I give you? Too late here. Can I give you how I prepared for the Oscars? So as of right now, for Best Picture nominations, I've seen Get Out, mm -hmm. which I didn't even actually realize. So the funny thing about the Oscars this year, I've heard tons of speculation just because I watched so much Collider, but I actually didn't know exactly what was nominated. Get like, out. With last night on iTunes right now, and I love this, that you can go on iTunes and there's a section that just says Oscars and you click on right. it. It's got all the stuff. Voodoo has the same. I didn't, when I went to it, I was like, oh, Get Out got nominated. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, I was like, oh, that's cool. Uh, uh, the fact that Get Out is nominated, great movie, has no business being a Best Picture nomination. Never in a million years. Sorry. Not Sorry. Go, moving on, Dunkirk is the only. I other, would argue that is the only one based, based on based on at least a couple of these. Get Out is I'm a just, really really good movie. It is not a great movie. It, it's okay. not like a game changing movie. It's just not okay. Hold on, you started out telling me about how you prepared, and then right. you dove into our. Oscar I'm sorry. Discussion. Yes, I'm sorry. 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 So the rest of it, I went through and I watched the trailers for every single movie. And I walked away because I was going to watch one of them. I walked away from those trailers. I said, I do not give a fuck <laughs> about any of these movies. <laughs> the only ones that I was even a little bit <laughs> curious about, I love Paul Thomas Anderson. I fucking love his films. <laughs> not even that stupid movie I know. about him sewing shit together looked interesting to I, me. Uh, yeah. I, the other one I thought... The clothes movie? The other one I thought looked cool. I'm just going to give my hot takes on all these. The other one that I thought looked good to me was Call Me By Your Name. One of the only reasons I thought that movie looked really, really interesting is because it looks so different from yeah. movies, period. Right. Also, Timothy Chalamet, is that yeah. his name? Uh, got interviewed by Frank Ocean, and I like that. Other than that, it looked like something I was going to fall asleep to. Uh, Lady Bird is nothing. <laughs> okay. That's sort of how I feel about it. I haven't seen, seen it. The I haven't seen it, but didn't that movie come out last year? Wasn't it called Edge of 17? And haven't, like, why do these movies have to look like hipster indie movies and then get these nominations? Blade Runner 2049, without seeing that movie, this is a dong take. I don't give a fuck. It is a better movie. The Last Jedi is a better movie. I'm sorry. Okay. I would agree. The Lady Bird is just some clever fucking indie movie, it looks Be like. Before. I'm not saying it's bad. Before I'm, people I'm not, rip you for not seeing the movie. Yeah. I, I'm, this is I'm, a dong impression. I'm very, yeah, but I'm also defending you. Okay. And, and solidifying your take. Because right. Because I've seen Lady Bird. Yeah. And I agree with everything you just said. Right. Three billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri looks interesting. It just doesn't look like something that I want to watch. And it looks, it honestly, it looks like a really cool exploration. Correct me if I'm wrong. I didn't know this. Is it, was it created by the same people that did in Bruges? Yes. And Seven Psychopaths. That it, it doesn't have the attitude of those two movies, though. Right. The, who, whoever that director is, Mark McDonough. That guy is fucking great. Yes. And that, um, anything that that guy makes, if you were to tell me that it was in contention for some sort of best picture, or whatever. Right. I get it. So, uh, again, to remind you, we're having this before the Oscars, so we're hoping that this is a fun conversation here, uh, knowing what the Oscars what am I missing? are. What, what am I missing? Okay, so I'll, I'll run them down here. And Dun I'll, Dunkirk, I'll, to me, feels 100% like a Best Picture nomination. I don't think it's deserving. I but think it's I, I get completely it. absurd. I get deserving. it. Yeah, yeah, But I don't agree. Um, okay, let's... Uh, I'm going to... Because I've watched a couple more of these. Wait, can, can we go through a few, just real quick a few other like best picture winners over the years? And I just want to compare a few of those to some of these as to why. A Saving Private Ryan, obviously, the scale of it in general. That's not a best picture one. I'm just saying nominations, nominations and stuff like that. So Saving Private Ryan, this, it has this huge scale, this huge execution to it. That movie feels like something that would deserve something like that compared to a Lady Bird. Uh, a Birdman is a movie that has, it, I didn't care for that movie, at least has something to say in it, and it has things about it that I would totally get. Uh, and, and there's still, even though that's such a, 
okay. So I think yeah. Edge of Seventeen is far and away a better movie than Lady Bird. Okay. I enjoy Edge of Seventeen just a whole lot more, and it, it, it's not even really a matter of who came first. I just I just enjoyed that movie more. Right. I related to it more, and it, you know that's that's just one of those things. It's mm-hmm. just I'm just looking at it and calling it as I see it, but um, I lost my train of thought. Even even the Revenant is a Where movie you, that, that oh has, you're talking about Birdman. I'm sorry. Yeah, Birdman is such a small, simple story. Mm-hmm. If any other director, they could have made a Lady Bird or not just seventeen. Right. But there's so there's so much spectacle. There's so much extra oomph. Exactly. Artistic, uh, like the artistry with that movie. It's just different. The mm-hmm. approach of that movie, unlike any other movie that's ever been made before in history. Yeah. That's what gives that movie the attention. Well, and you can argue if it's overrated or not. But Lady Bird just seems like a story to me. Lady Bird is just a thing. It just seems like a story. It's just a collection of some scenes that happen. Okay. And and that's sort of what I summed it up to. It's yeah. like it made me laugh a little bit and it has its quirks. I called it uh it reminds me a lot of Napoleon Dynamite, uh, but not as hyperbolic. But but it's just a lot of awkward interactions yeah. and the editing has its own sense of humor. Awkward interaction, cut to a goofy shot of them dancing outside of a building, and then cut away to something else. Like there's a there's a humor to the editing of it, and I laughed a couple of times. Right. But ultimately, you're just watching some things happen. You don't really expand on any of them. It just it's her weaving through, interacting with this character, this character. It's like it was like even something like it was like watching a it was like watching pinball. You're just yeah. watching the ball bounce around. E- and then it goes away. Even a movie, <laughs> even a movie like The Departed, which is my favorite movie of all time, it, it at its core it is just a story, but the story is so, I mean, immaculately told, and it's so interconnected and interweaved. It's a, it's I a, could go on and on about The Departed. I'm, I mean, that's what I'm saying. That's the achievement there. It's right. like if you're going to be a Best Picture nominee. You got to have something to you that I just my and, mind is blown and, about. And to be fair, there are people like uh, our friend Christina mm-hmm. who who said that she related a lot to Lady Bird. I get it. You can relate to. And there's I'm not. I, yeah, it looks like a movie I would want to watch. It but, just not I, specifically for when, when it comes to just like any other movie. I I love the idea of anybody relating mm-hmm. to a specific movie. I think that's what ha- everyone having their own individual favorite movie for the said reasons, personal reasons. That's what makes movies so great. It but. seems like a millennial, like a, a very millennial representation of, especially for, for women. I mean, I, I think Kayla watched the trailer with me. And I think Kayla would like the movie. Yeah. I think she was like, really, it's funny though. Cause when we went through most of them, I think three billboards was the one that she wanted to watch the most. Uh, okay. Let me, let's go over these. Okay. I, Cause I, I did play a little bit of catch up here. Uh, so out of the nine nominees, I have seen shape of water, Dunkirk. Oh, that's the one I forgot. Dunkirk, three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, get out and lady bird. So I've seen four of the nine. Um, I love Spielberg to death. Uh, the post has an outstanding cast. I think that I forgot movie, to watch that one too. I think the movie is very timely, and I am not dismissive of that movie whatsoever. But when it comes to having an Oscar conversation, and who, who knows, I might see it and be like, "Wow, that should have won an Oscar." But Spotlight, it's very rem- reminiscent of Spotlight, and Spotlight's just okay. It was a movie to me. Yeah, I don't think it deserves a Best Picture. I don't think Spotlight represents a year in cinema in yeah. any way, shape, or form. Was and Wolf of Wall Street nominated for Best Picture? I think so. No business. I love the movie. No business. Um. So anyway, Shape of Water. You hear a lot of the fish banging jokes. I thought it was just like a. I thought it was just a joke. Y- you it, know, it is actually a thing. You know why? You know. <laughs> you, you know why I didn't watch that? Why? That's the one that probably ticked outside of Dunkirk and Get Out. The one uh, that's the one that probably ticks the box for me personally. It's got a sci fi element. You know why I didn't watch it? I don't like living in the past. It looked too old for me. So, Shape of Water, and the way that sort of, we sort of tackled Birdman, I think Shape of Water can kind of fall into that category. Of film. They're nothing like each other. Right. But in terms of what we think might deserve best picture, I get Shape of Water. Shape of Water 
is a beautifully innocent movie and the character work. And I, I'm not the biggest fan of Guillermo del Toro, but what he did with that movie was just sort of a magical experience. I enjoyed it so much. Um, I don't know how I feel about a couple of things in it. I mean, I was it was very awkward for me to watch them. Okay, so there's not a sex. Does scene. the fish fight somebody? No. See, I want to see the fish fight somebody. So there's not, they don't show them pounding, oh, Okay. but they 100% insinuate, like she drops her dress and it insinuates that they bang. And why are you spoiling this for me right now? That's everyone has been joking about the fish banging movie. I'm just telling you how it was depicted. It's not a spoiler. It's not a spoiler. It's the cover. It's the poster. He was dead the whole time in the sixth sense. I hope someone's listening and you spoil that for them. Because <laughs> that would be amazing to find yeah. out that someone still had had that spoiled for them. Um, Goose dies in Top Gun. I just, uh, I didn't actually expect it because I thought we were all just joking about it. And then it kind of happens and it's like, I don't know about this. Did you watch it with your mom? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Perry Nimeroff did. Per Perry Nimeroff reviewed it with her grandmother. Her grandmother loved it. Oh, I'm sure. Um, but anyway, I don't know why I said that just now. Uh, I have nothing to be uh, other than that. It's sort of like a, uh, it's sort of the La La Land to me. Like, I don't know if it'll win best picture, but because of the technical aspects of the film and because of the, the, the innocence and just the joy that you get out of watching a movie like that, I can see it winning like best director for Gu uh, Guillermo del Toro, but I don't think it's necessarily best picture winner. Uh, darkest hour, um, I'm sure it's a great movie. It doesn't interest me. Uh, historical movies in that fashion, uh, political historical movies, and that might be summing it up uh, too simply, but it just doesn't interest me. I'll get around to it. Uh, it's all Dunkirk. It's just it's one of my least favorite Nolan films. I know you enjoyed Dunkirk a whole lot more than I did. Uh, I did. I enjoyed it. Um, man, that's a weird statement. Uh, least favorite. You know what? For me, I, I wasn't engaged emotionally. It just, I get it. Uh, the, I I think it's just sort of outside of, sort of outside of uh, Nolan's work in terms of how I would rank someone like that. It's like the band that it, it'd be like talking about Childish Gambino's catalog and then being like, oh, where do you put, where do you put? Uh, because of the internet. No, what's the what's the most, most recent one? Why am I forgetting the name of it? Uh. With me and your mama. What is the name of that album? That album. It's like it's like saying, "Well, where do you put that?" Well, I don't know. It's completely different from the rest of his stuff. So, I uh, the way that again going back to sort of like Birdman, the way that Nolan always has to have like the extra thing about his movie, the the movie that makes it so high concept. This might sound a little bit hypocritical, but. Of all the times for him not to do that, I wish it was with Dunkirk. What do you mean? I, I would like. I wish he would have. I wish the the concept of having three separate storylines with, with mm -hmm. different times relative to each other, and then weaving that together. Yeah, I wish that that just wasn't part of it. Like, actually, for, I actually agree with that. For the first time, just having a straight narrative. For the first time, I wish Nolan just kind of made a movie mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of making it a Christopher Nolan movie. Like I, I just the, Nolan, the fact Nolan that, fight it. The yeah. fact that Nolan was doing something different than what he normally does was yeah. enough for me, and I, I just didn't think it worked when he added that extra to it. I th the thing about that movie that's fascinating to me, and I think that works, is that it sort of just defies what a movie is supposed to be. It just says sometimes movies are supposed to be escape, so so to speak, and they're supposed to be. An experience. I know that's sort of a hoity-toity thing to say, but it's just like, you know. I think he was the director of photography for the movie. I don't need, I, I don't always need a narrative if I can still go and be entertained by a movie. Like, it just mm -hmm. it just doesn't have to happen. Um, you know, Fantasia didn't have a narrative. Phantom Thread has, not only do I not give a shit about that movie, there's, yeah. there's no buzz for it. There's I mean, just nothing. I mean, no, it, nobody is talking about that movie. Yeah. Here's the thing that I, here's the thing that I told Kayla. I said, listen, I'm interested in watching this because I love Daniel Day-Lewis and I love Paul Thomas Anderson. And 
I love Johnny Greenwood who, from Radiohead, who is now getting talked about like crazy again because he's a really interesting composer for film scores. But I think, I think the thing, <laughs> the thing about the movie that really even turned me off about it was I told her I said if we watch this movie, it's going to be very very slow and dry because that's Paul Thomas Anderson. But even even before that, like. The trailer was slow and dry, so I yeah. was like, Ugh. even with There Will Be Blood, it's like you can tell there's going to be some tension. I don't know where that's coming from with this movie. Right. Um, three billboards. Um, it's important to note, best drama from the Golden Globes this year. Uh, the ceremony, you can have your opinion on it, but it means something that a group, to me, it means something that a group of individuals said, this is the best drama. Yeah. So, uh, and I enjoyed the movie. Um, a lot. So I, I, I'm rooting for that right now. I don't know if that looks like a movie with a lot of layers to it. Both. Yeah. There's, there is a lot going on in that movie. Yeah. And it, you know, commentary on, yes. on police commentary on race commentary on just justice system, justice system. And also just, uh, maybe how people mourn, uh, death yes. and, and whatnot it yes. just seems like there's so many levels to that and that's something that that's what i'm looking for and, it's, looking and for. it's very well acted it's just well done it does not have the same attitude yeah. of in bruised and seven psychopaths uh i thought it was kind of interesting because you know it is a foreigner and it's it's very it's of martin mcdonough's three movies that we've talked about it's tackling americana in a right. sense as well because it's rooted in uh obviously missouri title of the movie, he, but he, it, it's just an interesting to have that outside perspective obviously well. i haven't seen uh the movie but just judging by the trailer it seems very in character with his directing style he knows how to do some very interesting things with inner weaving tones mm -hmm. like there's no way a, a movie like for instance in bruges throughout a majority of that film is pretty dark comedy i mean it is a dark comedy but my God, does it get really serious? And there's a there's same thing with Seven Psychopaths. There's some times where you're just like, "Fuck, this is heavy." Like I love that Seven movie. Psychopaths. So do I. I think it's great. It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, it's um, the better Smoking Aces. Those two movies kind of fit in the same category to me. Smoking Aces is great. Okay. It's fine, but I've never thought to compare them. But now, I, I now know, that we are, I think I still prefer Smoking Aces. Um, sorry that Death Wish was so bad, Joe Carnahan. Did he direct that? He he wrote it. Oh, no. That that movie he has been talking about Death Wish. That script has been in circulation for years, and he can never get it off the ground. Then it does, and then Bruce Willis stars. Eli Roth directs. I'm really sorry, Joe Carnahan. <laughs> um, I, I'm just terribly sorry. Uh, get out. We've talked a lot about that. Uh, the post call me by your name. You seemed intrigued by, um, Timothy Chalamet. Sufjan Stevens performing at the Oscars. Amazing. Uh, so fucking cool for that guy. Timothy, Timothy, yeah. Timothy Chalamet has been talked about a lot. He was also in Lady Bird. It's in two movies. Yeah. Um, what's, what's funny about that? And I pointed this out in my, I reviews. have no idea what he's from. He's the, did he come out of nowhere? He's Casey, App, young Casey App, like an interstellar. He's McConaughey's son in Interstellar. Didn't know I was supposed to give a shit. You weren't. You just, I figured you'd be like, oh yeah. And you're just yeah. acting like you haven't seen Interstellar before. Um, so what, here, here's what's funny. Saoirse Ronan, it seems like she can only be in movies. Because she was in that uh, Brooklyn movie as well. So Saoirse Ronan can only be in movies that are, well, I she was in The Host. But anyway, lately, she's in all these Academy Award nominated movies. Timothy Chalamet uh, is in Lady Bird and Call Me By Your Name. Lucas Hedges played the son in Manchester by the Sea with Casey Affleck. Uh, he is also in Lady Bird and Three Billboard Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Yeah, and then Michael Stolberg, who is in Shape of Water, he's also in The Post. There are so many crossover actors that are in all these movies of the past of this year, like the year before. That's cool. It's it's just funny to me. Uh, call me by your name. I mean, even I was like sort of entranced by watching this trailer. I feel like I would love the movie because it just seemed it just seemed different. 
like Kayla said, what year did this come out? And I said, it came out this past year. It's up for the Oscars. She said, it looks like something that came out in the 90s. Like it just looks different, feels different. Again, I think it's super fucking cool that Sufjan Stevens is playing the Oscars. Like that's such a big stage for him, for somebody who's had such a storied career from a music perspective. Right. And I I love that uh, Fr- Frank Ocean doesn't speak a lot, but he said that, Whoever the director is of uh, Call Me By Your Name, he said that Frank Ocean has had a very troubled past recently uh, with his father, so much so that he his father sued him for defamation or whatever. And Frank Ocean went uh, went on his Tumblr and basically said that the director of uh, he's proclaiming that the director of Call Me By Your Name is his new father. <laughs> <laughs> and then he uh, did an interview with Timothy Chalamet. And it was just the most likable thing ever, so much so that they were kind of nerding out about each other. And Timothy Chalamet ended up quoting a Frank Ocean lyric. And Frank Ocean said, please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> it was so honest and genuine. But, uh, yeah, I really want to watch that movie. Um, so, anyway. Did you I, see it? Call Me By Your Name? Yeah. No. So, oh. Call Me By Your Name, the release date for that movie is March 13th. So, it's the week after the Oscars. But I can watch it now on iTunes. You have to buy it. You yeah. can't rent it. It's different. Okay. So? I'm not going to buy a movie like that. Why? Because I'm never going to watch it again. I bought The Disaster Artist the other day just because I wanted to watch it. I'm probably never going to watch it again. Right. And I'm saying that's ridiculous and I would never do that. But but you'll go and eat a meal and enjoy it for an hour for the same price. I have to eat. So? You can... It's a better investment to just buy the movie. No. Yeah. If I'm going to wait a week for a <laughs> rental price? No. But what if you want to watch it again? This argument sucks. I could rent it for the second time and it still wouldn't amount to me owning it. What if you want to watch it a third time? I don't. How do you know? You've never seen it. Okay. That's enough. Um, I think best picture is, um, again, I think a category like best director, just in my opinion, I usually go for the director that has a more technical film. So I don't think shape of water or Dunkirk will win uh, best picture. I think the, the movies most likely to are three billboards and the post, uh, the post because of spotlight, but also how timely it is. And in this Trump era and three billboards, because of all the movies that I've seen, I, again, I haven't even seen half of these. I think it has the most heat, and it was Golden Globe's best best drama. So those those are my predictions. Um, I hate saying it because I know a lot of people are happy. I know a lot of people are fed up with. There have been like five female directors ever nominated for mm-hmm. the Oscars total. I I feel bad that I don't like the movie, um, but you know I. Why do you feel bad? I mean, if you don't like it, you don't like it. Yeah, no. Just because a woman directed doesn't mean you have to like it. Yeah, no. Uh, that's just my prediction. Do you have any kind of take on? Yeah, I mean, obvi- other than you don't think Get Out deserves to even be nominated. No, I mean, listen, uh, I know people probably won't like that, but it's just, I mean, I think I think it's a, a a good movie, but it's not necessarily something that I see. Like, I feel like any other year, a movie like Get Out, it would easily not be in there. Right. So that's just sort of how I feel about that. It is a really good movie. I really like it. Like I'd probably give it an A minus, maybe. Um, so yeah. At best director, I think will be I would love it. I would love it if it went if it won. In fact, right. I want it to win specifically because I want Jordan Peele to be able to walk up on that stage. Right. Uh I think best director will go to Guillermo. Uh just to run down actor, Daniel Day Lewis, Timothy Chalamet, Daniel Kaluuya, Denzel, Gary Oldman. Nobody is talking about Roman J. Israel Esquire. Sorry, Denzel. I think it's going Gary Oldman Darkest Hour. Uh because of Gary Oldman and that movie has more heat than Phantom Thread and Daniel. Would Day, love so. Timothy Chalamet to win. Just I, I'm, he's I'm with- fine with that too. Uh I still have I mean, he didn't do anything in Lady Bird to excite me, but then again it was part of the tone of the movie that the character that he played. But he's nominated for Call Me By Your Name. Cor- yeah, correct. I'm just saying based on what I've oh, seen gotcha. of him so far. Uh, best Actress, Sally Hawkins, Streep, uh, Francis McDormand, Margot Robbie, Saoirse Ronan. Um, I think this is the best category. Like, this is the one to win uh, for all of these ladies. I I think it's phenomenal. Um, I, I, I don't know. 
I don't know. Like even Saoirse Ronan, I'm not taking anything away from how she performed in Lady Bird. She did a great job. I truly have no idea. I think there's a lot of heat around Frances McDormand. But then again, a lot of people are talking about Marco Robbie and I, Tanya, And I don't know. Like, I think best actress is the most stacked, unobvious category that we have here. I don't know if you had it up or not. No, I'm not. I'm looking at Instagram stories right now. <laughs> Uh, that's pretty much all I wanted to do anyway. Um, Last Jedi, don't forget, best musical score. <laughs> um, I don't really even remember the, the score for Last Jedi. <laughs> John uh, Williams. Best uh, supporting actor, Sam Rockwell, Woody Harrelson, Christopher Plummer, Willem Dafoe, Richard Jenkins. Um, I oh, yeah. I did, I did watch the trailer for... Florida, Florida project, project. Yeah, like, whatever. Um, Look colorful. I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I just don't know enough about that. I mean, obviously, I've seen those two in um, three billboards. And I think Sam Rockwell uh, beats out Woody Harrelson, but Christopher Plummer's obviously he could be in there to make a statement about Kevin Spacey. Aren't they making a TV show about that same movie? What movie? That Christopher Plummer. All the money in the world. Yeah, aren't they making a TV show about that That's now? My knowledge. I think so. Oh, okay. There's something I forget what it's called. Um, best supporting actress Leslie Mainville from Phantom Thread, Allison Janney, Laurie Metcalf, and Lady Bird, Mary J. Blige, and Mud, uh, Mudbound, Octavia Spencer. Octavia Spencer didn't have enough to do. It's kind of like Mark Rylance and Bridge of Spies. He was in like he he barely did. I I think Allison Janney without a doubt, and I Tanya. That's all I've heard about from all these actresses. I watched um. I watched the trailer for I, Tanya too. It's funny because Kayla wasn't familiar with the story of Tanya Harding and uh, Nancy Kerry. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of, she was like super taken aback by it, which is funny. Um, that's all I got. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited to watch the Sufjan Stevens performance. Other than that, I'm not going to be taking in this content at all. <laughs> so, all the best. I hope it's a but, great night. But if you are not... I can't wait to hear about it on Movie Talk. <laughs> if you are not in the Sight and Sound Facebook group, we had a really fun master post for the Super Bowl. Uh, we're going to do another one for the Oscars. So if you haven't already, if you want to chat about the Oscars in real time while it airs, join the Sight and Sound Facebook group. Link is in this very description. A master post will be created and everyone will be talking about the show as it airs. I think the master the post group. should be a watch along and you should do the watch along. I'm not going to okay. commit to that. Fair enough. Um, take a break. I gotta yes, let's take a break. It was a long segment. It was an hour long segment. I know. Let's, uh, we'll come back. We'll do some TV discussion to add on some music discussion at the end. Okay. Ryan's going to go to sleep. Take it easy. Goodbye. We love all of our Sight and Sound listeners. Now, I'm saying listeners with extra emphasis because if you aren't subscribed to the Sight and Sound YouTube channel, you're missing out on a huge chunk of Sight and Sound content. Ryan is holding it down with all of his movie stuff. I've got album reviews and retro reviews. We've even introduced some new video shows as well. Ryan and I are both doing trailer and music video reactions and I just introduced a new music discussion video series called Sound Off. Go ahead and complete the Sight and Sound content cycle and subscribe to the Sight and Sound YouTube channel. Link in the description box of this podcast. Just a quick reminder, we are recapping Counterpart. There's like four episodes left in season one. Um, right after that, we will be starting season two of Legion. It comes on FX. This is a big deal for us uh, for the second year now. We originally hosted a separate podcast called Let's Talk Legion. It was the official Legion after show for the TV Time app. If you don't know what that is, get familiar with it. Uh, we just recently made a deal this week. Uh, we're going to do season two of Let's Talk Legion, but it's going to be on the Sight and Sound feed. And uh, the Sight and Sound podcast will yet again be featured on the TV time app in the same way that it is for counterpart. But uh, we're just excited because we already had this built in audience of let's talk Legion listeners that aren't even really aware, may not be aware of what sight and sound is. So now we're bringing, bringing, bringing them home 
And so we're excited to get started. Uh, if you haven't seen Legion season one, it's available now on Hulu in its entirety. You have a month to catch up. Uh, the season two premiere is April 3rd and the, uh, the marketing for this show is ramping up. We're subscribed to the FX YouTube channel. They've been throwing out a bunch of quick little teasers. So, uh, I'm excited to get into the feels of, of Legion yet again, Jay. Yeah, it's, it's an exciting time, but it's also a weird time for television. I think because we sort of got a few shows right out of the gate this year, but we're sort of in between some things starting and something. And obviously there's shows that are going on like the walking dead. There was a whole new story that their ratings have tanked even further down, which I love. I love the fact that that show is now doesn't have the it's awful angry of you. Well, I, I like that the show doesn't have the excuse to be around of, well, there's so many people watching. It's just, if those people aren't there anymore, then they're going to have to either step their game up or just go away. I just don't, <laughs> I'm fine I, with it. I just don't think I agree with you. I What's f- that? What do you mean? You were, you're talking about being in this in between. I feel like TV has been nonstop all year. Well, what I mean, what I mean by, so th- obviously the way that we do TV segments week to week here, we either talk about major, major occurrences that happen in a, season that's going on or we're previewing a show that's about to start or a trailer that's about to come out. What I mean by that is there's not a lot on the forefront of things for us to like, there's not one show for us to say, here's what's coming up next week or here's a trailer. That's well, the mistake up. we made is that Jessica Jones premieres, but we already did the preview for that. Right. So exactly. That, so, comes out, that comes out this Friday. So that's, that's really what I mean. But for some reason I feel like TV lately one of the things that I love about television is the water cooler discussion. I love I love talking about TV and sh- having the shared experience of fandom with so many people, especially things that we get with like Game of Thrones and this and that. But it feels like TV is more a little bit more disjointed than it's ever been. Now, that's not a commentary on the success because I think TV is wildly successful. It's just harder, I think, right now to have that um, that commonality with people. Do you share that sentiment at yeah. all? Okay. No, I do. Okay. I mean, th- think about how... I think that might be what I'm... Think about how people are reacted I mean. to Counterpart. E- even For though, sure. like, us us even watching Counterpart was a complete accident. Yep. But, like, getting people involved... It goes back to that complaint I had a few weeks ago. Where I see people to know I'm taking my boots off right now. Nobody... I just need them to know. That's what... I need to paint a picture. Um, With his green mic cord. That's and right. vape in hand. Um... Anything else? Bunny Bear is on his Spotify. On his, I can, I can see it. You can kind of see it. I yeah. can see it on his laptop. Um, for one, us watching Counterpart was a complete accident. Uh, but like, okay, we we've, we've been doing that show for like six weeks now, and our group is just maybe they're watching that show. Maybe they listen to our recommendation. It goes. I back sort of to, found out that there were people watching it that I didn't know were watching it the but other day. It, it goes back to the complaint I had a few weeks ago, and I guess a lot of people feel this way. I I said a few weeks ago, I, I'm done. I'm done with hearing about what other, and this is hypocritical. But I don't force anybody to watch anything necessarily. But the people that are like, oh, you've got to watch this show. Right. It, it, TV is so widespread. TV starting to feel more I'm, like music. It, it's not like movies. And you brought this point up. It's like there are only two or three movies that people are regularly mm-hmm. talking about at a time. But with television, it's just everybody. Everybody knows what they want to watch or don't watch. Like, yes, I'm open to recommendations, but. I don't want to have that. Like you have to watch this. Like, have you started this yet? I just, yeah, we, I get, a, I get annoyed by that. Movies are the only thing like it on in the three pillars, and especially with what we talk about. Everything else, we're sort of just trying to be tastemakers. I feel like, and I hate that word in the sense of like, because it makes us seem like oh, we're tastemakers. We're just trying to get you guys hip on what to check out now. The whole we, co- yeah, we, we do give suggestions and recommendations, but I'm I guess I'm talking about more of a personal dialogue right. with people in my daily life. We're not like, saying you have to watch it. Yeah. And in the same thing, don't expect us to watch it just because you like it. Right. But we love you. Um all that whole that whole conversation does sort of get flipped on its head when we talk about what we previewed last week, which is Atlanta, and we did mention <laughs> you okay there? He's dying. He's dying. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Why are you covering it like it's going to matter? Because I'm still going to offer commentary. That's why you don't take a big, you don't take that big of a rip off of off of the bomb. Yeah, very good. Okay. You also don't do it. <laughs> you also don't do it while laying down like I have been all. Oh my also. god, you've been too comfortable. Like yeah. it's made me uncomfortable. <sighs> Two things make me laugh <sighs> in this world. One, I think it's hilarious when people cry. Two, I think it's really fucking funny when people start coughing <laughs> like i just find it very amusing i'm glad because they can't control themselves like there's no way you can put like a box around what's happening right now <laughs> why have you been so loud all show i don't i, I the the red light on your god interface, damn the yeah. red light on your interface has been distracting me all show it's been doing that the whole time oh no it's okay we'll figure it out anyways yeah, look. See, I'm peeking out right there. It's fine. There's a limiter. So Atlanta's back. Yeah. And what's what's unfortunate about Atlanta being the water cooler discussion is that, one, I do think it's still a little bit niche. Like, it hasn't crossed over. It hasn't broken through to the... Like, I didn't have anybody to talk about the show with after I watched it the other day. There are people I could talk about it with, but not in my, you know, beckoning call. Um the other thing is that there's not a lot of discussion that can really... I mean, you can quote it. There are quotable lines. There are things... People were talking about it in the Facebook group. Absolutely. Absolutely. Again, quotable lines, like memorable, funny things that happen. But it's not like we can speculate on the narrative and this and that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But when this show came back and I watched it the other night, I was immediately transported back into this world and I was immediately reminded why it was so special of a show. I loved every second of this. I did too, but I've realized while watching the show, I was thinking about it as it unfolded. I don't think I can tell you why. I, I have no idea why I like this show. It makes yeah. me laugh. It's so weird, but it's like... I think when it comes down to it, it's how well it's executed. Like, I don't think this show could be done any more perfectly. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's acted well. It's shot well. It's like, the color grading, and it looks fucking good, and it's it looks different. I think that's something worth saying. It's a lot more dreary. I, I saw, first of all, Donald Glover doing the rounds on, uh, on media duties. Like, it's funny. It seems like he's done more media for this then I saw him do for Childish Gambino. He's done virtually no press for Solo. I don't think it's, anybody has. It's funny because he was on Colbert. Yeah. And he watched was, the whole thing. He was the second guest, which always has about eight minutes as opposed to the first guest having two segments. He came out and they mentioned him rapping and Atlanta a little bit. And right. then there was an interaction with him and a fan. I was like, I, I was surprised that Stephen Colbert, of all people, being the. Uh, a friend of J.J. Abrams and the Star Wars fan that he is. He's a much bigger Lord of the Rings fan, but he likes Star Wars too. I'm surprised there wasn't a single Star Wars question uh, while he had Lando sitting there. So it's it's funny because Donald Glover, he's a weird guy. He is. He's very strange. Because you, it, it, for me, my first interaction with uh, Donald Glover was on Community. When you met him? <laughs> yeah, when I, when I met him on Community was the first time I really had a taste of Donald Glover. Right. And that was also the time when I found out he was a stand-up, which I guess is just a very small portion. That's Very small. That's Probably the, most, the smallest thing. I was going to say, that's the, if anything's on the back burner for Donald Glover, is stand-up. Right. But that's what I had in my head. And then Childish Gambino, I probably hadn't listened to a lot of his music yet. But I thought of him as like this wacky, funny guy, because that's who Troy is on Community. Yeah. And... Who he actually is, or at least how he's represented in the public, it's completely different than that. He's just so he's just kind of weird, and he's, he's I don't know. He's just kind of artsy, he's just kind of little bizarre. hipster. Yeah, he's bizarre and out there, but uh, w which of course is a great representation of the show. But what's what's interesting is that I'm surprised that there is not a group of people that looks at that show and says, "Why is this good?" Like I like in the same if, way we feel about uh, the same way we feel about Twin Peaks. Yeah. Well, I feel I, I feel I like it's because it. it's rooted more 
in a rela- it's more relatable not obviously not to us because we're two white guys but it looks like first of all let me just say but, this one of the most interesting things about the show is that it's called Atlanta but there are things in this show that feel closer to Kentucky being in rural settings from time to time you know being in in some of the more urban places and this and that. like it it just feels relatable at least for me when when i watch it just just in this settings somewhat even like that the fast food restaurant they were at the other day i was like i feel like i've been there before <laughs> it's just right. it just feels that way but but yet the to sort of add a book into the media discussion that he was on the New Yorker had a great article. I've, it's so long. I haven't even finished reading it. <clears throat> it's a, it's, it's a fantastic piece talking about where Donald Glover might or might not be acting as a character of himself, like a caricature of himself in this piece. Really interesting read. Very bizarre. Very fascinating. If uh, he is, he's even more bizarre than I thought. Exactly. Yeah, and it's uh, it's just interesting, and I think this show, for again, I I just don't know how it could be executed any better. Down to the jokes, the timing of the jokes, how they call back on jokes, how it's shot, just how it just seems like this show is Donald Glover and his whole team, his brother Stephen, uh, the cinematographers on the show, the right the writing team. It just seems like their avenue to do whatever the hell they want. Like that opening action sequence shot of a shootout. I've never seen that before in Atlanta. But it was it was incredible. It was just really good. I don't know why. And it was also just a statement. It didn't have anything to do with the it rest of the episode. It set the tone. It's such a it's just a, such a bizarre show. And and we we've known that. In the entire there's no narrative to it. The show doesn't depend on the narrative or what we know of for the character paper boy. Like I, I have, said, there was there was an interpretation of the show, especially before we started it. This is gonna be a manager, it's gonna be his rapper, um, cousin. None of that at all is represented in the season two premiere. Right. It doesn't involve that at sort all. Sort of, sort of. So first of all, there there are a lot of things uh, out right now about the show from the reviewing community that have seen more than one episode. I think it was sitting at like a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes for a minute. I don't know. It might still be. Um, some of the statements about the show so far, not ne- necessarily negative criticisms, but minor notes that people are saying about it is that it feels more of a narrative now. Obviously we don't know that because we haven't yeah. seen more <clears throat> than one episode, but like for instance, Let's just talk about if you haven't seen the show, no spoilers. Obviously, there's really nothing to spoil. But it's a sitcom. Yeah, there's nothing to spoil. So not in a, not in a traditional sense. One thing, but. one thing that I don't know, and I probably will never know about the show, but I feel like let's just remind people: the show wasn't on the air last year. It's it's been a year since. Uh, I'm sorry, it's been year two years. Two yeah, year and a year and a half, two years to, since we've fall ha- of 2016. had Atlanta, and. I don't know how much time has passed in the world, and that's a that's a real question to ask because the circumstances that we find our characters in, we have no idea. Like we don't know the relationship between right. Donald Glover's character and Paperboy, or Donald Glover's character and Lakeith Stanfield's character. Like, but something has happened, so it's just like I, I don't know. The story can go anywhere from here, and I, I find that very interesting as well. Um, like I said, I'm shocked that there isn't a group of people just hollering at us or yeah. at people in general who, cause this show just gets overwhelming price. And I don't know if it's because Donald Glover can do no wrong. I don't know if he's that type of guy that appeals to mass audiences. Like, I don't know this might sound crazy, but in the way that nobody says shit about the rock now, yeah. obviously they're on different levels, but I mean, that's how I relate them. It's like, I feel like Donald Glover does no wrong. He's the one thing that people are pumped about for Solo, and we've gotten two shots of him in a trailer. It's like, for whatever reason, he has that gravitas to him. And so the thing about Atlanta, I think it's like the the show somehow pulls off this. It feels like a YouTube video that you (laughs) share with your friends when you have nothing to do. It's like 
and, and we've it had has, that experience. It has a massive over, rewatchability. I can't. Yeah. Th- we had that experience. I we had both seen the entire season of the show, but there was one time that I came over late one night, and you were like, "I was playing you, episodes you, like it was a playlist, like yeah, it was a mixed." Yeah, exactly. Just it was skipping just, around. It just it feels like something you share your friends. It's shared to your friends on YouTube, yeah. even though it's a thirty minute comedy. Well, I was actually about to say. I think one of the reasons why I've I've never met anybody that hasn't seen the show. And doesn't love it. Does that make sense? Like yeah. You either, you either haven't watched it or you just think it's great. And it just it make, it makes no so sense to me. I think one of the reasons why that is is because, cleverly enough, Donald Glover has set up this show to where he, he sort of put in all of these, uh, like, things about it that can't really go wrong. Like, there really isn't a narrative, so you can't complain about the narrative. And, but there's also no compromising. And like you have you have right. the impression that he doesn't give a shit about any of your expectations. He's not asking a lot from you in the sense where the the episodes are only thirty minutes. They're incredibly digestible, so it doesn't really overstay its welcome. If anything, it sells it short a little bit, and it's not necessarily like the show is so wacky and weird. Anyways, like it can really throw anything at you of absurdity and you sort of just buy into it. And again, that goes down to the fact of how well it's executed, I think. And it's just, it's great, man. I love the fact that the show is back on air. Um, the watch, I don't, I think it might've been Andy Greenwald that said that, (laughs) and I don't know if I would go this far because it's sort of an outlier, but he said, this is the show that every network wish they had. And it's the show that every, uh, you know, television creator wishes they were making. And I was like, I don't know if I would go that far. I agree with that second part. With the creator thing? I think just, every creator... Just to be able to do whatever you want. Any showrunner, any creator, any artistic individual right. wishes they had their Atlanta. Okay, to a with certain that, extent. Without I any that. bounds? Yeah, I mean, I think it would be a lot of fun, but I think that there's a lot of people... I think there's a lot of people that would want to tell a more straightforward narrative type of story, but... And, and I think that's where things will get interesting with Atlanta is if they ever do decide to cross over to that boundary and tell a linear story of some sort with while still keeping the same aesthetics that we know and love of it. That's if they can pull that off. I mean, my God, we're talking I, about something complete. We're talking about one of the greatest shows of all time. Maybe I think I, mean, I think they will do it. 100% in the way it that, would be a challenge in the way that X files explores those individual tones episode to episode yep. in the way that Mr. Robot addressed that in season two with one particular episode, they made it feel like an 80s sitcom for a portion of it. I think Atlanta will do that. That's there will be, a sh- there will be an episode that may feel like it's filmed in front of a live studio audience. And it's just, well, we've been before. there. We've been there before with them, like with the sort of the BET, sort of episode that they did. I'm talking about going even farther. Well, what I mean is I'm saying crossover into telling a narrative, like telling a story that from episode to episode that feels more like, you know, feels less like a procedural. Kind of like how Louie, there's a season of Louie where like four episodes and the one season was about that hurricane. Right. Well, and and X-Files does that too. It is a procedural, but... But there are certain episodes throughout the season that do tie in together. Right. Um, so maybe they do that. I don't know. But I, I'm enjoying it and um, I'm watching it in a weird way. I'm Well, I'm watching it the same way I watch everything that's on a network. I'm watching it on iTunes. So I get it uh, I get it the next day or I guess really late that night. I woke up in the morning and watched it. Um, other things that are going on in TV, I haven't watched this show. So I'm sort of just going to echo some things that people are saying about Hulu's Looming Tower. Apparently, Hulu's method is the opposite approach of what Netflix is. Netflix just announced that they're <laughs> they're like planning three million shows to come out uh, on Netflix. Uh, I don't really care about that as long as we get some that are good. A lot of people, a lot of purists, are saying to themselves like, "Oh, that's too much. You don't have to watch everything, and the best will rise to the top." They're just casting a wide net for their business model. Hulu is taking the opposite approach. They're giving us less shows, and they're putting a lot into those shows. Uh, This Looming Tower show has just a ridiculous cast behind it. Is it the Jeff Daniels show? Yes. But uh, right now, a lot of the comments that are coming out about it is that 
it's falling pretty short. It's the show's not great. Um, the tone is all over the place. It, it just doesn't really make sense. I think I think Hulu really struggles to get their originals out into yeah. the forefront. I mean, the only one to really hit is Handmaid's Tale. It's also I mean, other it, than that. It also seems like it's not even like the like Handmaid's Tale at least was somewhat of like a maybe unintentionally was sort of a topical sort of show dealing with you know women's issues and this and that and social commentary on things going on with with women's role in society. Whereas this one is just sort of like some political, I don't know, political drama that they've thrown at the wall to see if it'll stick, which seems strange because they've invested so much money and again, so much star power. And it's like, couldn't you have done this with something that was a little bit more, I don't know, topical. I feel like it, it it feels like another, uh, I can't think of what that movie or boss, there, there's a couple of there's uh, there was a Kelsey Grammer show called Boss, and then Kelsey Grammer had another show that was recently canceled. Um, <laughs> it reminds it, it just like they could have taken place in the same universe. Almost, I mean, it, it just feels like you have this one big actor, and maybe by accident, like Power and Billions are examples right. of these that somehow just broke through. But it's like I don't know, and, and those those shows have their audience. But by no means would I say that those movies really break through yeah. in the way that I would like to see a Hulu series break through. We thought it was going to be the path. We thought it was going to be Man in the High Castle. Accidentally became Handmaid's Tale. But ultimately, and maybe maybe Catastrophe has its audience, but it's like these Hulu shows, I mean, they're just not breaking through in the way that even some of these Amazon series seem to be. You you also have Mick Mafia that came out on AMC that uh, some people were talking about. Obviously, AMC's seen pretty significant drop-off in terms of where its place was in this whole landscape. Yeah, Not a lot of people buzzing and talking about AMC shows as much as they used to. I mean, it used to be like an AMC show came out or was announced and everybody was anticipating it as and what it, it could be. it was only because they had two hit shows. Right. I mean, well, it was three, like, three. If you take Mad Men, Breaking Bad, oh and yeah, right, Walking Mad Dead, Men. yeah. I th- actually, I thought that's what you were referencing, but no, you were talking about Walking Dead, Dead and Breaking Bad. Right. Did sure. Yeah, but then they had shows like uh, the, well, I don't know. They had that one. With, what was that Western show? Oh my god, the railroad show. Yeah, Hell on Wheels. Hell on Wheels. Into the Badlands is still going on right now, but they also had um, what was that? Is it the Night? Not Night Watch. Uh, night. Night Guard? Night? Are you talking about that Mark Strong show? I don't know. There was that show that Mark Strong was on that just came and went. There was that shitty David Schwimmer show. Oh, I don't know what that is. That was is. like the dog pound or something oh, like that. I have no idea it what It was that about is. him like wanting to start a restaurant and uh, his brother was... I have no idea what you're talking we, about. We talked about it. The Night Manager. That, that the was, Night Manager. That was the one with Loki. Wasn't it the one? Right. With, and uh, you had the one with Ian McKellen, which was... Uh, where he was like, it was Ian McKellen and Jim Caviezel. Jesus was in some TV show. What? Yeah, it was like a, it was like a mini series. It was based on some crazy uh, book, I think, and it was like a, a series that they did over in Europe. Uh, I remember. You know why I know about this? Uh, Josh McCuga used to do this show on The t- Prisoner. Yeah. This is literally the first <laughs> time I've ever heard of So it. Josh Makuga w- one time, it, actually it might not have been Makuga. It might have been, what's his name that used to be on TV Talk? What's his name? David Griffin. It might have been David Griffin. He was doing like his version of Indie Picks for TV and he talked about this show, this concept of a TV show that happened overseas and it sounded like one of the coolest fucking TV shows I'd ever heard and the way he ended it was he was like, oh, you know that that show prisoner that was on AMC and they're like, yeah, they were like, it was essentially a remake of the show, but it was just not nearly as good. And I was like, what uh, for one? Okay. So I legitimately have never heard of this show until yeah. right this second, 18% on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. We need to watch the trailer looks cool as hell. Wait, wasn't the killing um, on AMC? Yeah. Yeah. So AMC just sort of dropped off, but I've heard okay things about Mick mafia. The way I want to end talking about television I want to bring up this concept that they did bring up on the watch. Um, basically, this argument from sort of snobby snobby critics in the TV space saying that we live in a landscape right now with great TV shows and with a lot of opportunities for TV shows, but we're 
in a landscape with a lot of B minus level TV shows. What's your take on that concept and idea? That maybe back in the day of Breaking Bad and Mad Men and Lost and all these shows that it was higher, you know, higher quality TV more often. But do you think we're just getting too many mediocre TV shows today? Yeah. I think I would agree. I think so too. I, I think I, just by the volume that it's, we're I was going to say, it's just the result of the, of the volume, but it's also... We've also may, been talking maybe, about how TV is... I, we gave TV the pop culture crown last but, year. But maybe, yeah. Well, I mean, last year was just an unprecedented year, but things just sort of fell into place in the way that I think movies just kind of came together for this year. But I think part of it has to do with the fact that there are people like Netflix that are all about the volume and watering it down a little bit watering down, but also people also networks and companies being competitive for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. Like it's right. We were talking the the, the other, uh, a few weeks ago, Amazon seems to be the, the people and maybe FX to an extent as well. Amazon cares about making the best of something and then pushing it out. And I think, but they're just starting out doing that but that's their philosophy and i don't know if i don't get a sense that everyone feels that way i get a sense that everyone is just trying to put out the next big thing without without taking the proper care to like i don't know if everyone is out to make game of thrones every single time and they just come up with a counterpart which i'm not taking anything away from it but Mm -hmm. it's you know because of the volume of television, a show like Counterpart could easily just kind of fall by the wayside. Yeah, I think a lot of the criticism was that initially it's heavy pitch, heavy idea on the first like half of a season, like selling you on the concept, and then we'll figure it out the further in we get to it. Just if once we've seen that it sticks a little bit, I think eh, I almost said that Mr. Robot could potentially be guilty of that, but I actually don't think that's right. I think it's in the opposite. I think. I think Mr. Robot was challenging you to stay on board because they knew the the roadmap. Um, but there's some other shows out there, like The Path was probably like that. Like cool on the initial buy. It's the it's the series that we've like given up on and it's like, okay, whatever. But they're quote unquote good enough to get the next season. Yeah. So maybe a Bates Motel. Ba- I, I would agree with that. I Fargo? And I, I like Bates Motel a Fargo? lot. No. Okay. Fargo's different. I think Fargo's I think Fargo's prestige. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of there's there are shows like a lot of FXX shows that I'm not like Baskets and right. what, Man vs. Woman, whatever that Jay Burr show show. I think there are shows like that on FXX that I'm not connecting with so far. But uh most of FX dramas I think are examples of what I'm talking about. I'm I not, mean that seems to be <laughs> FX has been the new AMC the past few years. I'm not completely caught up right now on American crime story. I'm I'm about two weeks behind that show is fantastic, except it has taken a heavy, heavy, heavy drop off in the last couple of episodes. So a few and quality episodes. or audience. Oh no, no, no. I'm talking and quality is not even the right word. The story that they're telling and the way that they're telling it, I am just so not invested in it. It's narratively they're 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 swinging and missing. People are not at all talking about Versace right. in the way that they did People versus OJ. It's because it's week to week OJ was all I heard about, and I wasn't watching yeah. the show. But it I, that the coverage of that show was bombarding me, and I'm not seeing anybody talk about the, Versace. The reason that is specifically is because they have gotten the balance all out of whack. The show is. Honestly, it's annoying that it's even called the assassination of Johnny Versace because it is purely focusing on the murder, like literally going whole episodes only showing Versace once. Right. And they're they're bouncing around in time. They're actually moving backwards in time. Your complaint is that we're not building up to the assassination. It doesn't even have anything to do with that. There are so... Just like with OJ, there are so many things outside of the murder itself that become fascinating. Like, for instance, they did that whole episode specifically just dealing with the 
the psychology of being a juror. And then that carries so much weight through the rest of the show. They're just telling a story and they're telling it in reverse. And I don't know, man, it, I'm just, it's like, it's, I'm, I'm, I don't care about some of the characters that they're throwing at us. And it's just like, ugh. Right. But there's a lot of interesting things going on in the show that I do want to know about, like Versace's life and this and that, to give me more weight to this character. And they're just not spending enough time with it. The execution is unfortunate, in my opinion. But it could come back. It, it's honestly just been... It, there have been three episodes that have derailed the show. Two episodes specifically where I'm just like, I just don't care about what they're telling me right now. Right. So it's unfortunate. But yeah, I haven't heard anybody else talking about it. If you're watching... Versace, let me know. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about music? Real yeah, quick I'm going to have to go soon. We'll get the hell out of here. I love you. Um, Spotify just went public. Yeah. Do you care? It's cool. It is cool. It's I, interesting. I, rem I remember finding out about this little old company from Europe right? Uh, from a friend of mine, and uh, it became the next big thing. Let me paint a bizarre picture here for you for a second. So companies within the pop culture landscape go public all the time. It's not a big deal. But Spotify doesn't just represent something in the music industry. Spotify and music streaming is the music industry. So it's sort of like the industry <laughs> just went public. That's a weird concept to think about. Obviously, Apple is already a publicly traded company, but you know they have their hands in many things. Right. Spotify's business model is the music industry, and that went public. That's a weird concept to think about, but we've known that this was going to happen for a long time. Um, it honestly doesn't really mean anything. Ultimately, it just doesn't really mean much. It definitely doesn't mean anything for the artists. The business itself of Spotify uh, – there were a lot of these articles that came out like 10 things we learned from the announcement of Spotify going public. And they already wrote these articles when they talked about what would happen if Spotify went public. Right. Let's run them down. Uh, they want to grow. Well, no fucking shit. Uh, <laughs> they want to add more to their service. They've been doing that with video. They had added pod. They even cited podcasts in this like business announcement. I'm like, it's been a thing. Yeah. And Th this right now is on Spotify. But also, <laughs> podcasts, one, aren't going to really contribute much to your uh, your stock numbers rising unless you invest in podcasts and... Have their own serial. Or yeah, we're not... I'm not seeing any money right now from Spotify. Like, if they're a publicly traded company, should we be seeing money on there? I don't know. I don't if know. we're contributing... To, I don't know. <clears throat> um, it just doesn't really mean a lot. Uh, the fact that Maybe Spotify might start being in the business of investing into artists. I don't know. It just doesn't mean a lot right now. All I know is that uh, Spotify is still a massive company. They're the biggest music streaming service. They made sure to note that. They, they might be la They're projected to be lapped by Apple. Though, right. Um, Apple year. does have a, a ways to go, but absolutely. Um, and I just think that the business is still losing a lot of money. Right. A ton of money. And I still am not convinced that they're not in the business to sell. So I don't know. I, I don't know what really could come of that. Um, I did want to talk real quick about Warp Tour. If I can find my phone. Hang on. Do you see my phone anywhere? Uh, it's in my pocket. Okay. So Warp Tour, last year of Warp Tour. Yeah. You know, the rock genre is in a great place right now. Um, <laughs> let's talk about... I just want to run down some of the... First of all, what would your anticipation be for the... Have you seen the announcement yes. of the bands? Yeah. What would your... Before even knowing what this this whole rundown of bands would be, what would you think the Warp Tour final tour would be? What would you expect to see? So I think year to year, if I was to put it on a grade scale, my impression of Warp Tour... For one, I've only been to like two Warp Tours right. ever. So... And it comes to how year by year, uh, 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 how much does Warp Tour actually interest me? I would give it like maybe a, a C every year. I would expect a B plus. The who's who. To an A. Sort of like a greatest hits of Warp Tour. Absolutely. Uh, and based on what I remember, I mean, I haven't memorized it, but based on at a glance what I saw there, I see 
C minus D plus as far as how much it actually interests me. Because and the reason I say that is is the amount of volumes of bands that I'm interested in. And maybe this speaks this can speak a little bit, and I'm not gonna rip warp tour or anything, but th- part of this is because I'm <laughs> it'd be literally beating a dead horse. <laughs> right. There'd be no point. But part of this is because me and that genre of music have grown apart from each other. I know there are bands like Under Oath that are in there, Don Broco as well, but it's like, usually there's several bands that I would be interested in seeing. And this is just, I can't believe how uninterested I am in that, in that lineup. Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest takeaway from this, and I'm not saying that they didn't try, I'm sure that they probably did, but there are bands who came from the Warp Tour uh, history books that could have been on this. There are bands that haven't been that could have showed up. For Katy Perry was on Warp Tour. Eminem was on Warp Tour. Linkin Park was on one stop of the Warp Tour, and it was like this big deal. And obviously, Chester's dead. So, what? yeah, there's that whole thing too. Wow. But I, I just think that Man, was this a huge, huge letdown when I pulled this up. This looks yeah. like it could be any year of the Warp Tour in the bad years. <laughs> so I'm just going to run down a few bands uh, on this thing. Get your take. These are in alphabetical order. Uh, 303. Yeah. Don't care. Yeah. All Time Low. Uh, 303 okay. is probably one of those bands that Warp Tour helped tremendously. Absolutely. Completely uh, irrelevant. All Time Low. Okay. They had their heyday. Irrelevant. Asking Alexandria, one of the bigger bands of the music genre, not a band that I particularly Ugh. care for, but um, only only on a handful of dates. But one, they're I I I understand they're approaching that, that upper upper echelon of so, popularity. So far, I understand these movie or these bands being on the lineup, and I could see it. it I could see it uh, impressing somebody else. Right, August Burns Red. Cool. A band that I honestly would have seen having moved on from Warp Tour. Uh, I, I I saw them on Warp Tour. The so fact that they're cool. there now is is interesting. Bear Tooth, another band that I've seen sort of outgrowing Warp Tour, makes a lot of sense on on there as well. Uh, Bowling for Soup. I feel like they've been on every Warp Tour that's ever existed. Let's see who else can we talk about here. D's Nuts. <laughs> I see D's Nuts. Don Broco. Yeah, that's cool. A band that I feel like needs to be on. Warped I was gonna Tour. say I'm glad that they are. Right, they they can be that much more exposed before Warped Tour goes away. Every time I die, sort of a cornerstone band. Glad yeah. to see them on there. Another band that's been on there a lot, but it would have been kind of strange for them not to be on there. Four Years Strong. Not sure if they're even a relevant band these days. A big band, a, definitely a, a big band at one point. Um, I'm just not a fan of the genre. Right, Knocked Loose, a band from Kentucky, a band that's grown quite a bit, probably would be one of the bigger bands on Warp Tour. Um, Lesson Jake, another sort of mainstay. And listen, I'm also talking about some of the biggest bands right now. That, the Main, you have a you have a take on the Main? I've seen the Main a couple of times. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Once on Warp Tour. A band like Movements, who is coming up through the ranks, uh, signed to Fearless Records with The Plot and You, and now Under Oath. Uh, I fully support this band being on on uh, on the tour. Picturesque? Picturesque? I uh, I know a couple of those guys. My Children, My Bride. I don't care. Yeah, exactly. The, la- the last time I remember <laughs> that band being anything uh, was 12 years ago. I haven't heard them anything from them since. Right. Here's where we started to get into some of the more interesting bands, some bands that I would probably expect to be like on the final Warp Tour. Simple Plan. Okay. Massive band. Yeah. At one point, probably absolutely. completely irrelevant. I was, I was a huge sense. fan of them in their heyday. Absolutely. For sure. Silverstein, another mainstay of the tour, but a classic band. Taking Back Sunday, Some 41. I've Okay. I've... Maybe I just didn't memorize this list very well because I feel foolish because I feel like I I glanced over a lot of these. Okay. Because as you read them off, I'm not saying that my attitude is changing, but uh, I uh, I don't think what I said about the greatest hits qualifies anymore. Well, because these are you're, the more you read them, yes, I am picking up on the. I can hear Luke Jagger <laughs> screaming at me. Uh, yeah. No, I, the more you read them, the more all of these bands make sense. Uh, but. 
But it also kind of makes me realize that a lot of these bands who are big, bigger bands yeah. who have ever played Warp Tour and are coming back, they're very, very, very relevant. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah, Simple yeah, Plan yeah. is a big band, but yeah. um, like, I would have liked to have seen one just gigantic band come and play every single, like w one stop on every tour. Anyways, moving on, we've got uh, Under Oath playing a few stops we've talked about them that. a lot twisted you know who twisted is they're like the cousins of icp um unearth big metalcore band right okay whatever the used makes sense that is cool yeah wage war one of the bigger sort of metalcore bands and then this thing of uh, additional special guests to be announced and there's a bunch of smaller bands that are playing as well but yeah i, I guess i just thought there would be more to this uh kind of going out with a whimper i feel like um it i i, I don't know i guess it could go either way i mean we could debate how, is is warp tour the final year of Warp tour going to be more about these bands that right. made warp tour what it is or vice versa <laughs> or is it going to be about displaying a don broco and a thousand below or like that yeah. kind of band that's still coming up so uh that was an interesting debate it looks like they're going uh with the former and uh, yeah, I I think I was mistaken. The more you read bands out like mm -hmm. less than Jake and the Used and Silverstein, um, I get it. Well, um, but it I am just not that high on it. One of the things that's killing Warp Tour, and in my opinion, killing touring for a lot of these bands, is the fact that we live in the festival era of music today. So the entire, I would say. Ohio Valley, air, this area that we live in, like Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, Missouri, Michigan, all those states, Warp Tour is crushed because of this gigantic music festival that happens in Columbus called Rock on the Range, where not only can you see most of these bands, but you could see even more bands like Stone Temple Pilots and Tool and A Perfect Circle and like I don't I don't know who else is playing. I mean, massive, massive, massive bands. And I'm sure some people are saying, "Why go to a Warp Tour when I right. can have three times the experience seeing shows like this?" And there are those festivals all over the country. Um, I, I do think it's it is hurting the music genre of rock music, though, because I I just told you to have all of these festivals. Yeah, I just told you. I mean, it's great to experience as a consumer, so I get that. But, and not necessarily though, because sometimes you're getting a lesser, a diet show. But I told you off air, I'm going to see a concert this year that has two bands on it that I'm excited to see about, or I'm excited to see. That's the first time I've done that in probably a decade where I've gone to a show and been like, these two bands, I'm so fucking excited to see both of them. I had that issue even back in the day. Yeah. But there were like some really prime shows that I went to that were just really, really good, but only like a handful. Right. Any stick out to you? Just like throw well, out some. One of my favorite shows that I went to, and this will speak to the time, Pierce the Veil, Mayday Parade, Emery, As Cities Burn. Right, like all bangers. And they were, it was at the height of their powers. Yeah. Come Now Sleep, for Cities Burn, Pierce the Veil's first album, uh, Emery, I loved, and uh, Mayday Parade. Mayday Parade had that first great album too, Lesson in Romantics. I was all on top of that stuff. So that was fun. Uh, oh, Sleeper, The Chariot. Um, they played with somebody. Yet. I don't know if it was at Cities Burn again or not, but I mean, I was all about that show at the time. Um, uh, there was another show that Color Morale opened for. I can't remember who was on. Th this is just back in the heyday when you could see shows like that. Like I remember, it might not mean much to you, but I remember going to see uh, this band called The Famine that I liked a lot, O oh Sleeper, Advent, um, uh, Living Sacrifice on their reunion, and Demon Hunter, and the same show was massive. I remember seeing uh, Under Oath, uh, As Cities Burns, as cities burn. As cities burn. Excuse me. Me without you and the chariot on the on the same show one time in Nashville, which was crazy. I remember that might have been the tour I'm talking about. Yeah, I wasn't in Nashville, but I think that might have been the tour. I remember local shows that used to be killers. I'm like Patrick would love this if he's listening. It was uh, Gwen Stacy, the Devil Wears Prada, chasing victory on show. You know what I'm saying? Like three bands. I I remember that. Yeah, and. Uh, I, honestly, the best show I've ever been to was a Warp Tour. Yeah, because I had it was ABR Prada, a day to remember, 
um, and Under Oath all on the same show. Right. And, and it was it was one of the best things ever. Although I will say there are tours that exist that I would love to go to. They just don't come around here as much. That right. the fucking Under Oath Bring Me the Horizon tour uh, recently was like Architects. Well, I, thrice in Balance and Composure was right. a good, and Circus Survive. Um, architects and um, counterparts were were doing a tour together. I think with somebody else opening. It's, I think it's getting better. I, I really do. But these these big festivals, man. I I just I don't think that's where this music genre is right now. And I think right. it's hurting more than it's helping. Right. Anyways, that's all I got. Um, short, sort of short on music topics this week for all of March. It's looking a little bit bleak for music releases. We had a great open to the year. Yeah. It's getting a little, uh, little strange, although we do have under oath to look forward to in <laughs> April. Um, where can they find you online? Guys, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at what up Snell. And yeah, if you go there, you, you'll know everything else that we do. Um, if you're interested in joining the Facebook group, uh, if you are just now discovering the podcast, maybe on Spotify, we had an email. Someone just found us looking for counterpart. Uh, so if you're if you've just stumbled upon this podcast, we have an entire YouTube channel uh, with additional supplemental content. Uh, we also post our podcast there. So if you're ever just at a desk and you want to have your podcast play right then and there, you can. And, uh, yeah, talk to us. Our email address, we don't really push it, but our email address is also in our description if you have anything you want to get out. You can find me at Jay Williams, J to the A to the Y to the E on Twitter and Instagram. It's the same for both. Also, you can check out my music separator, Room to Grow EP out now, wherever music is found. Big thanks to everybody that checked out more than music. That's awesome. The next episode will drop later this month. It's called Converge, hardworking and heavy as hell. Uh, I need it to drop later in the month so that it gives me more time to finish the episode after that. Hard to, <laughs> hard at work on the color morale one. Uh, I see a deadline stared at me, but that's okay because I've got like two months. Can we do it in two months? Well, yeah. I don't. Know. I'd hope so. It took me. I, I it took can. me a year. To, I was gonna <laughs> to say finish. I can. I could just come in and sit down and give you my my few minutes and then go. But uh, I don't know about you. Yeah. All right. We love you guys. Thank you guys so much. You got anything else? We out, y'all. Bye.